1993, the last time the University of Idaho Vandals lost in that building. Since that time, they have been nearly perfect. 21 straight. The man that started that streak, John L. Smith, handing the baton over three years ago to Chris Tormey. Tonight, he's on the other side of the sidelines looking to end that mark of 21 in a row. And how do everyone and welcome. My name is Dave Tester, and tonight I'll be bringing you all the play-by-play -play action of this exciting Big West matchup, and I'll be joined by a former Vandal. There he is, Jerry Kramer, the all-time great for the Green Bay Packers, number 64. Before he was a Packer, though, he played here in 1954, 55, 56, 57, went on to play in a couple of Super Bowls, and now he's with us. And, Jerry, we're thrilled to have you here. And you told me you remember your days of playing against this Utah State team. I remember playing against them my senior year down in Logan, and we beat them badly. And I'd like to see that happen again tonight. It should be a great ball game, and I'm excited about it. I know both coaches are excited about it, and every football player in the house is excited about it. How tough is this for John L. Smith, for Chris Tormey? Friend turned foe. Well, you know... Uh, there's a lot of conversation about, oh, it doesn't really mean that much. The players are going to be playing, and we're just coaching. But there's a lot of energy there, and there's a lot of emotion. And both of these coaches want to win this ball game in the worst way. It is the Aggies and the Vandals. We'll have more from the Kibbe Dome right after this. Back on the campus of the University of Idaho, just moments before kickoff. The key to this game for the University of Idaho is going to be their offensive front. They've got to protect Brian Brennan so he can throw the football there. You can see the numbers on the five-year senior for the Vandals. Brian's a wonderful football player, but we have to give him the time to throw the ball. We've got three freshman offensive linemen. We've got a great core of receivers, and we thrive on the pass, so we have to give him time to throw the ball. On the other side, the University of Idaho is going to be challenged with stopping this guy, Demario Brown, who Chris Tormey told us today he's going to play in the NFL sometime. This is an NFL-type runner. I believe he's fifth all-time for the Aggies at this point. He's a sophomore, 6'1", 215 pounds, breaks tackles, stiff arm and is a fine football player. We have to stop number 21 and contain number one for the Vandals to win this football game. All right, there you hear it from the man who's been down here and seen it all firsthand. When we come back, it'll be the kickoff, University of Idaho and Utah State. Back in the Kibbe Dome, where throughout the game, our man on the sidelines will be Jeff Caves, where, Jeff, we understand there will be some strange sounds in the Kibbe Dome tonight. That's right. The University of Idaho went back into a closet, and they found a box full of these little crickets. So they passed them out to the three or four sections full of students. So you need hear a nice constant. Enjoy it, guys. You better take one of those home for your kids, Jeff. <laughs> we are set to go. Utah State winning the toss, but deferring. So Brad Bond will kick it off. There you see the series record. It's the first time that Utah State has been here since 1974. And taking the football will be Jeffrey Townsley. Townsley taking it in his own end zone. Has the running room along the sideline. And Townsley starts it out for the Idaho Vandals at the 31-yard line. Now the man leading the way for the University of Idaho will be Brian Brennan. There he is, number 11, the fifth-year senior, who players and coaches tell me that he understands this game so well. And you look at the numbers on Brennan, and you can see that he has the concept of what the Idaho Vandal passing tack is all about. The Vandals and the Aggies just underway. A must-win for the Idaho club if they want to stay in the Big West hunt for the title. Brennan throws it on first down. Look out. It's complete. So Idaho gets things going the right way as Deion Price, or check that, Antonio Wilson makes the grab. The offensive line on this club is big, but they are young. Three freshman starters, they are young, but getting better. And the receivers, we say look out for Antonio Wilson, along with his teammate, Deion Price. So after the 16-yard pickup, the Vandals on the move just... Rubbing the edge of the midfield, Mark Brennan. A little play action. And Bucky Ahi catches it. The young man from just down the road at Lewiston, Idaho, gets his home crowd going early. The Utah State defensive line a little bit beaten up. Ben Crossland is not 100%, but even at half speed, he is very good. The linebackers led by Tony Diamato. He is the Big West Conference Defensive Player of the Week. 
if there is one question mark about Utah State, it might be that secondary. And Brian Brennan, after picking up another first down, will indeed be testing that tonight. Thomas in motion, the quick pass. Deion Price picking up about three yards and a flag on the play. Jerry, right now you'd have to say the Vandals are doing exactly what Chris Cormie needs. Moving the ball well. Uh, they're they're uh, throwing the ball uh, very quickly, uh, not giving that big defensive line a chance to rush and uh, very good rhythm on their passes right now and uh, doing well. Brian Until Brennan. That flag, excuse me. Getting the penalty against Idaho. Of course, that's something Idaho cannot afford in this game. They had a lot of mental mistakes last week in their loss against Nevada. Here is the call. The illegal block in the back, above the waist, on the offense. Ten-yard penalty from the spot of the foul. Repeat, first down. This is exactly what we can't do, David. We have to play error-free football to, to win this ball game today. Brennan, who is amongst the leaders in the Big West Conference in total offense, back and forth with John Dutton of Nevada, the pack of the big win today. Keep it on the ground to Jerome Thomas. We had a good visit with Joel Thomas, and he talked about the challenges of being injured in the very first game of the year out for the season, but he hangs in there. He still has good spirits. Got a lot of commitment. He got a lot of heart, and uh, it's been quite a trial for him to second year injuries and but he'll be back Chris Tormey wishing that Joel Thomas was playing he feels very confident he said about Joel Thomas getting a medical hardship here second down and long Brennan again to toss he's got a man along the sideline that's Jerome Thomas and Thomas is out of bounds even if he would have brought that football down incomplete pass and he'll bring up a third and long Excellent protection here. Uh, had plenty of time to throw the ball, threw the ball deep. Uh, close, but no cigar. Jerome Thomas, if you're going to play running back for the Vandals, you have to be able to catch the football on the season. 22 grabs out of the backfield. 230 yards. Third down and long. The Vandals need to get it to the 28. Brandon rifles it deep. He's got a man. And Ryan Restomonico is the intended receiver. I looked across the middle, Jerry, and I saw Deion Price wide open. I, I thought they had plenty of time again. Uh, ball was just overthrown. So it'll bring up a fourth down. Brian Brennan will talk things over with the coaching staff. And Troy Scott will hustle onto the field to boot this one. Mike O'Neill will kick it on fourth down. O'Neill gets a high spiral punt. Steve Smith will let this one go. Good defensive coverage as Jeffrey Townsley catches it right on the three-yard line. So, Jerry, that certainly helps out the Vandal defense. Excellent defensive play. Good heads-up football. Put them in a hole and give them 96 yards to go. Excellent play. Can't ask for much more on that particular play. It must be strange for John L. Smith to be on the other side of the sidelines. Chris Cormie trying to basically get rid of, if there is a ghost of John L. Smith, doing that, a victory would certainly help out. You see the numbers on Sock. He's not fancy, but very effective. Of course, when you have Nakia Jenkins and Demario Brown, who takes the ball on first down, you don't have to be real fancy. As Ryan Skinner comes up and makes the stop, he's the leader on defense for this crew. The offensive line, big and active for Utah State. Jordan, 6'7", 300 pounds, and then Rommel over at the other side. He's a small guy, 6'5", 312 pounds. Skill position, we told you about Demario Brown, great runner, Nakia Jenkins, a wonderful receiver. They've got the whole package. Second down and about eight as Matt Sock brings his team up again on the ground. And this time it's Melvin Blue. The Vandal D led by Tim Wilson at his defensive tackle slot. He would probably have a shot in the NFL depending on what kind of defensive season he has. Wilson, a big guy, very quick inside. Uh, battled injuries last year, but he says he's 100%. Skinner is small and slow, according to John L. Smith, but he says, you know what, he gets the job done. Secondary led by Gunn and McGinnis. You can hear the crowd on third and short. And Blue gets 
that's enough for the first down. And that's what Idaho has to stop. And that's what Utah State's going to keep doing, Jerry. All day long. We, uh, we're looking for uh, Brown. And uh, at the moment, he's not in the ball game. Well, let's see. We'd have blue, we'd have brown, and we'd need black. So we'd have black <laughs> and blue and brown. <laughs> All the colors. So quarterback Matt Sock, as we said, his senior year, moved into that starting role last season, about midway through the season, has not relinquished the spot for Coach Smith and the Aggies. They are 1-0 in Big West play, trying to go 2-0. Sock fires it, incomplete. He had Guillermo Chavez along with Nakia Jenkins. They were in the batter, but you can hear Sock said, I don't know where I was throwing it. The uh, offensive line for the Aggies, as we were talking about, is about average about 300 pounds. And we're quite outweighed by quite a bit defensively. And uh, Junior Menares is talking about playing the shoulder or playing the gap to try to get some quickness past that offensive line. Second down and long for Utah State. Sock with one setback in blue, and Melvin takes the ball and keeps rolling. Oh, game tackle. Excellent defense. Well, of course, you know Ryan Skinner is going to be right in the middle of all of that. Ryan is a leading tackler with 82. Leading tackler on the club by about 30 tackles, so you can expect to see a lot of him today. But that gang tackle is what I like, David. There were five or five guys on the ball that time, and if we're going to stop this club, this is what we need to do. Good uh, football team. down again. We call it a homecoming crowd because it's John L. Smith's homecoming. The Aggies need to get it to the 26 for a first. Sock under That's pressure, but gets it. Up. Bryson Gardner comes up with the interception, his third of the season, and he gives this crowd something to really get fired up about. There wasn't a lot of pressure. Wasn't a great deal of pressure. Sock moves around, gets pushed a little bit, overthrows his receiver. Gardner makes a great interception, takes it back to about the 39-yard line. Well, Jerry, traditionally in the Idaho scheme of things, after a big turnover like that, as you see Bryson very fired up to give his club the ball back, they have been known to just throw it deep into the end zone, strike early. And they keep it on the ground where Jerome Thomas fools all of us and runs it for about a pickup of two. I think we're going to see him run the ball maybe a little bit more today, uh, David, to help that offensive line. That running game helps the passing game from the offensive line standpoint immeasurably. You just have to run the ball to keep that defense on us. So we may see a little bit more of that today. Brennan out of the shotgun. Five receivers in the pattern. The classic Idaho offense, and it's complete. And Antonio Wilson won't have enough for the first down. He'll be about two yards shy as they spotted just on the 30-yard line. He needed to get it up to the 31 and a half, and it'll bring up a third down and short. Battle moving the ball well so far early in the game, of course, but moving the ball well. I wonder how tough it is for Brian Brennan, who looks over at that other sideline, Artie Valero, who he said was a very close friend, a coach. Of course, there's, there's a number of those guys that are dealing with that. But in particular, Brian Brennan, the fifth-year senior. That's Jeff Pankratz from Centennial High School, setting up on the other end. And they keep it on the ground at Tanner, and he didn't get the first down. So, Jerry, I ask you, do you go for it on fourth down, especially with a struggling field goal kicker? Boy, we we're only uh, kicking about 50% of a field goal. Let's watch it again. Uh, Tenner gets stuck at the line of scrimmage. Excellent play by Lindsey Hassel. Good football player. He's one of the leading tacklers on that uh, Utah State football team and a fine football player. Vandals 0 for 2 on third down conversions. Their first opportunity to go for it on fourth down. Tanner again on the ground, and Tanner gets the first. Anthony Tanner, a freshman who has just come into his own, and I guess that, if there is a benefit to a player getting injured, Joel Thomas goes out, they activate Anthony Tanner, and all of a sudden you've got yourself a fabulous freshman running back. Pretty close. They're thinking about measuring it. That was the first down. 
And Tenner has done a wonderful job as a true freshman coming in to replace Joel Thomas and help out with the running core. Pretty exciting freshman. Vandal trying to protect that winning streak, which is the second longest in the country, and that is a home winning streak. And as you would expect, uh, Nebraska has the top spot. Brandon on play action. Better look out under pressure and goes down. So Brian Brennan trying to avoid the pressure got by one guy, but Caleb Smith was just too quick as he brought down the senior quarterback, Chris Cormy, who says, I had a pretty good game against these guys a few years back. <laughs> Chris uh, was telling us earlier today that he actually blocked a punt against them back when he was playing. Outside blitz and uh, Garmin, uh, the uh, cornerback on this side, put a blitz on and forced the, forced the tackle. bit of an interesting blitz to me uh, this early in the ball game. 23 Garmin uh, coming from outside uh, on that last play. Awfully close. Awfully close. Well on third and 17 Jerry I'm trying to get my voice back. <laughs> Are you that excited already? Had that already? Before, huh? <laughs> Uh, Handles are 0 for 2 on third down. And Brennan to roll, pump takes, and he's going to go down. Brennan Crossland. Yeah. And what did we hear about all day from the Vandals? Ben Crossland. He said, we've got to stop him. Number 95. Uh, excellent football player. Uh, missed almost a whole game last week with a knee injury. And uh, we weren't sure that we'd see that much of him today, but we saw a lot of him there. Mike O'Neill, who averages about 43 yards, recruited from the 40. Steve Smith will let it go. And again, the Vandal special team, led by Jeff Ancrats, gets it on the one. We'll be back to the dome. No score. We're just underway in Moscow. Dave Tester along with former Green Bay Packer great Jerry Kramer watching this watching along with John L. Smith spent six years here as the head man at the University of Idaho on the other side of the field Jerry had a pretty good record 53 and 21 excellent coach Winning and a wonderful coach. human being wonderful guy Matt Sock to pass wants to go up deep to Nakia Jenkins and it is caught as making the grab is Steve Smith, and Smith just ran under that football. A brilliant play. Well, Smith, with his 21st catch on the season, goes over the 300-yard mark for him in a year, and Smith, a guy out of Florida. How do you talk a guy from Florida into coming to Logan, Utah? You've got to be a wonderful talker. Steve Smith, one of the fastest uh, receivers on the Aggie team. Just absolutely ran under the ball, made a great catch, takes it down to the 35-yard line. Pickup of 33 yards. Not that Logan isn't a wonderful place, but you go from the hot, the sun, to the snow and the cold in the wintertime. Sock against, this time, Nakia Jenkins nearly picks it off. As the Vandals put on the good defense, Arnold Gunn right there going against Nakia. And that's not a guy you want to get paired up with one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the uh, Vandal defensive group felt that Nakia Jenkins here will catch 80% of the passes thrown. He's a wonderful receiver, and he's averaging about seven, eight catches a game. Caught 10 last week and 10 last year against the Vandals down Logan, so great receiver. 6.50 remain in the first period. No score, Utah State, the University of Idaho. Looked like somebody like jumped. A, looked like a little... This timing there. Sock on the road. That's Guillermo Chavez. Chavez makes the catch and he gets big yards. But I have a feeling that this may be coming back somewhat in a white jersey jump. I think you're exactly right, David. Guillermo, a big target at 6'3, 243 pounds. John L. Smith in his career has had some magnificent tight ends, and that's what's the key to the offense, this particular passing package. you got to have great receivers, but yeah, have a pretty good tight end as well. Five-yard penalty from the previous spot. Repeat, second down. 
the tight ends playing today are about the size of the offensive tackles when I played. They're uh, wonderful athletes. You know, they're half tackle, half receiver, and they have to be able to block and uh, help with the running game, of course, and then catch the ball and run the pattern. Of course, speaking of when you played, we'll be keeping an eye for number seven in Vandal Colors, 97. That's Matt Kramer, the son of Jerry Kramer. Bob Greasy doesn't have anything up on you, Coach. His Sox scrambles, scrambles under pressure, somehow gets away from one man, and Sox in a foot race throws it away. The question is, who did he throw it to? The Vandal coaching staff wants a flag on the play, but it looked like Sock was throwing it in the direction of a receiver. Nice play by the senior. He said he's not really flashy, Jerry, but uh, he does the right things at Utah State. A good, solid football player. Uh, shows some agility here. A little bit like a matador moves around the field and ultimately throws the ball in the direction of a receiver could have been called a grounding but there were, he had a receiver over in that neighborhood Whitney Mayer putting the pressure on coach Tormey had to insert him into the starting lineup the young man from American Falls for this one the crowd trying to help out on third and long and Utah State wants to talk things over Matt Sock didn't like it so he will walk the length of the football field to the sidelines and work things out. We've played almost timeout, a half of a period. Idaho, that is their first timeout of the half. With 6.15 remaining, we'll do the same. No score in the dome. Jeff Caves is on the sidelines. Jeff, we're wondering, where's Demario Brown? Well, it's got to be a disciplinary situation, Dave. He will be playing this game, but they're not releasing the reason why he's not on the field right now, so just look for him probably in the next series. Isn't it ironic that a year ago there was a running back by the name of Abu Wilson who found himself in the doghouse, and his replacement was a guy named Demario Brown? Exactly. Third and long for Utah State. Sock to pass. Under Tim pressure, Wilson. Tim Wilson. Oh, what a rush. Utah State, one of three now on third down conversions. They'll be forced to punt the football. What do you like about this Tim Wilson guy, Jerry? Quickness. I love his quickness. Uh, six foot, about 270 pounds. Uh, goes outside rush, and bingo on the quarterback loss of 12 so Jerry Arguello will come out and boot it from his own five yard line Arguello gets it off boy long kick Antonio Wilson has to run all the way back to his 17 yard line this guy only needs a little bit of an avenue but somebody got a paw on him and hung on so that's where the Idaho Vandals will operate first and 10 as Andre Pearson gets a glove on number three, so Wilson couldn't quite break it away. 64-yard punt, Terry. That certainly helps the defense. Quite a punt, yeah, 64 yards. He's averaging 43, and he's one of the better punters in the country, but 64 is really exceptional. Now both teams just kind of checking one another out. We expected this. They almost mirror each other. Same defense, the same offense. Now some, the purists will say they're not identical and they are not identical, but very similar. And the Vandals keep it on the ground. And Anthony Tenner will pick up about four or five. A couple of Big West Conference football games today. The Broncos at home losing to Louisiana Tech 31 to 27. Nate Sparks unable to go in that game because of an injury. Uh, the Broncos led throughout most of that contest, but Louisiana Tech comes away with a win next week. Boise State will take on this Utah State team. And Nevada over North Texas, 65 to 10. So they move into a tie for first place in the conference. Brennan rolling on second down, wants to go deep. Is the Bryce right? Dion goes up and makes the grab. Oh, oh interception. Interception? Yeah. Well, one official was there and thought Dion had it. The other said no. The defender got in and made a nice play. John Dell Carter. And there you can see hugs for everyone. It looked like a wrestling match there for a while. It could have been anybody's ball. And Carter comes up with it. Now, Chris Tormey's talking to Brian Brennan about tossing this one up. Well, Dion Price is normally going to bring that ball down, and it looked like he had the possession. Threw the ball about 60 yards in the air, and it was 
didn't look like anybody's ball, but Carter comes up with it. 46 yard interception. And Utah State will go the other way on our first turnover. Melvin Blue with the keeper. What are your thoughts on not seeing Demario Brown, who has had his trouble with the loss? Interesting uh, situation. You know, uh, discipline is, uh, in my book, uh, a part of the game and a big part of the overall team uh, attitude. If you don't discipline, you, you lose everything. It's awfully tough to set your number one running back on the sidelines and not let him play in the ball game, but he'll maybe learn something more important than football by setting there. A pickup of two yards. Check that, a loss. And there's Blue. And Melvin Blue gets it up. I think he's got enough for a first down. He's a guy who we saw great things out of it his freshman year. And then he was very quiet last year. Well, when you've got Abu Wilson and then Demario Brown, you are quiet. But this year, as the backup to Demario Brown, he's been playing a little more football. Nice move to the outside. Nice blocking up front. And good block for the wide receiver there. Blue takes it down for the first down. He's a big guy, too, Jerry. 6'5", uh, or rather 6'3", 225 pounds. Looks like a pretty husky fella. Seven carries, 13 yards. And it looks like Blue is going to be the man for the white. Sock hangs it up. And that is going to be complete. Steve Smith has been the man so far for quarterback Matt Sock. It's been his big play guy. Two big ones. We see, uh, saw Steve Smith catch a long ball on the other side of the field just a moment ago. When we mentioned he was the fastest uh, Aggie on the field. And again, he runs under the ball about a 35-yard completion. 33 yards on the completion. And Smith has two big grabs in this game. As a result of a turnover, an interception, a mistake by Idaho. So Utah State on the move, bouncing it into Vandal territory. Sock gives it off to Blue. Melvin spinning and turning before finally Bryson Gardner can make the stop. Big, strong running back. Got great upper strength, good leg drive. He was hit at the line of scrimmage by a couple Vandals and uh, still managed to gain about four or five yards. Looks like a gain of four. Matt Sock was 14th in the nation last year, and we might say a quiet 14th in total offense. He just kind of jumped up on people. He's six of seven today. And like we said, six of seven, perfect that way, with the exception of one, but not real flashy. 30 yards long, 33. Going to hang it deep to Nakia Jenkins, and Jenkins is there. Touchdown, walks in. So Nakia Jenkins kind of dazzled or put Ryan McGinnis. It was almost like he was watching the football game instead of defending it. Again, we told you what a great receiver this was. He catches about 10 balls a game and uh, really looked like uh, he wasn't tested too strongly on that particular reception. 28-yard touchdown, and the fans here are stunned. As Brad Bone misses it. His third miss of the season. Well, if there's any good news for Idaho, it's on that play, missing the extra point, and it's 6 to nothing. Utah State with the lead. They fester along with Jerry Kramer in the Kibbe Dome where Utah State has struck first. Leading here six to nothing after a missed extra point. That may come back to haunt that man there, Brad Bone, who, as I told you, has missed three now on the season. He will move this one out of the dome almost. So that means the University of Idaho will take over first and 10 at the 20. And you can see the scoring drive did not take very long. And what set that up, the Brian Brennan interception, five plays, 76 yards. Nakia Jenkins, his third touchdown on the season. Nakia didn't even look like he broke a sweat on that play. Looked pretty easy.
goes back to that turnover. And, you know, we just you cannot throw those 50-50 passes. We have a 50% chance of receive or completion or interception. Vandal's trying to make something happen. It is complete to Antonio Wilson. And Wilson extends his arm. And he will pick up about six yards. Wilson, the eighth all-time leading receiver here at the University of Idaho. Brian Brennan, of course, did not play last season. Brian Keen, of course, the starter. A one-year, you like to call him a phenom or a one-year starter. And Brian Brennan back at the helm. He started as a redshirt freshman for John L. Smith here. Hangs it up. Off again, so Brian Brennan is having his difficulties against this Utah State bunch. Is making the interception is John Dell Carter. Well, Carter is the man that uh, knows what Brian Brennan's going to do here as he makes another interception. Ball was thrown into coverage, but uh, didn't really have an opening, and Carter picked it off. Good, solid defensive football. This Aggie football team is a well-coached football team. John L. is an excellent coach, and he took about half the Idaho staff with him when he went down here and left the other, other half here. There's a tremendous amount of motion, emotion on the field tonight. Well, and you see that stat, 13 of 14 games in interception. As Matt Sock tries to go right back to work, complete to Nakia Jenkins. And Jenkins gets it up to the 37-yard line. Jerry, you wonder if the Utah State coaching staff has an edge because they know Brian Brennan so well. Do you believe that? Well, uh, it's very possible. They've uh, recruited him and coached him, and John L. knows a lot of these kids very well, certainly better than uh, Coach Tormey knows the Aggie team. So it could very well be an advantage for John L. All right, now it's a very quiet Kibbe Dome crowd that we've heard raucous a couple of times, but... Two interceptions have spelled one score and maybe a second. His sock keeps it on the ground of Melvin Blue, who jumps around and picks up a couple of yards before Ryan Skinner makes the stop. Again, that Aggie offensive line, 312, 312, 300, 298. The baby on the offensive line, the center at 290. That's like a uh, Packer offensive line. And three of the five starters are all Big West performers. So not only are they big, they are very good football players. And Melvin Blue is enjoying running behind him right now. And Blue has an opening. One man to beat. Touchdown. <laughs> Melvin Blue runs the football in. 35 yards for the score. And just like that, Utah State is up 12 to nothing, and we would guess they will go for two. We may not, we may not see Demario Brown the whole game. Melvin Blue is having a great game. Good blocking out front. It makes a move, cuts back inside, and uh, one more move, and it's clear sailing. He's home. We were gaming a little bit up front, uh, looping a little bit, and they caught us in the game and took it in. Kevin Hill actually had Melvin Blue in his hand, but that was the extent of it, as you saw a blue streak go by him, and now Utah State trying to convert after missing the extra point on the two-point pop. And Blue gets in. Well, just like that, with a minute 24 to go in the first quarter, the Aggies lead it 14 to nothing. Nine carries for Melvin Blue, 66 yards. He's got a touchdown. He's got a two-point conversion. If you had a fantasy football team in the collegiate <laughs> ranks, Melvin Blue would be a good guy to have. Big, strong running back. Going to take it in for a two-point conversion. Good surge off the offensive line. Oh, this is a touchdown play. Comes around the left end and makes a nice cut right here. Just takes it in virtually untouched except for one hand on him. As a result of two turnovers, of two mistakes, and you know, on that's a ball game. Uh, you can't do that, especially against a good football team like the Utah State Aggies. Well, Jerry, what surprises me is how good 
This University of Idaho defense is against the run. In the last couple of games, they've struggled, but you look down the stats, they've allowed less than 100 yards this season in uh, two games. You see that scoring play, 34-yard uh, touchdown run. Just in the first quarter alone, Utah State has run the football against what we thought was a pretty good run defense. The Vandals will try to get something going as Bone Duke to deep to about the six yard line, and that's where the Idaho Vandals will call on. Got the run, got the run, got the blocker, but go all the way. Townsend is pushed out at the 22, and you can hear Jerry Kramer. He was fired up about that. So is the crowd. 72 yards. And now, all of a sudden, there's a spark in the dome. That might get a fire started or something. <laughs> well, special teams can certainly help. And was there one particular blocker? How did he get loose? He got a, got a block right there. Uh, and then there, he had two guys in front of him here. It looked like he might go all the way right here. But got caught from behind. 72 yards. Now, the Vandals... Uh, jump off sides and actually it was the case the center and the quarterback had the count mixed up as Brian Brennan pulled out from the center and uh, Bill Verdonk had not snapped it yet. You know talking about Florida guys and going back Prior to Jeffrey to Townsley's all start on the offense five yard penalty still first down Jeffrey Townsley's long run. There's another Florida guy that decided to head west. So they must have some secret method to get those Florida guys to Logan and <laughs> Moscow. <laughs> Uh, I'll leave that one alone. A minute remains in this first period. Utah State up 14-0, but the Vandals trying to make something out of the long run as Deion Price catches it, and he is tossed down by Donald Deco after picking up four yards. Deco picked off uh, the Vandals last year, pilfering a pass from Ryan Fiend in that contest. Well, John L's Utah State Aggies are 10 and 4 when they score first in the John L. Smith era, and so far the 3 and 1 this year when they score first. Well, if the numbers go that way, Utah State has the edge. He's trying to get loose with Anthony Wilson, pushing away from the defender who looked almost like he had a little stick him on his hands, Bashar Livingston. And he couldn't get back in time. Two fine receivers for Idaho and Antonio Wilson and Dion Price. Not only are they good receivers, but they are very tall. Big targets for another tall man, Brian Brennan, who goes 6-5. Idaho 0 for 3 on third down conversions. And Jerry, you see on the screen, it's third and nine. Third and nine, and Ben Crossland put a, quite a rush on that last play and um, knocked Mr. Brennan on his backside. Brennan hangs it up deep. He's got a man. If he can make the one-handed grab, Antonio Wilson nearly made the circus play. Intriguing that the Vandals don't go for the first down. They are throwing the ball deep today. And maybe that's why they're 0 for 4 on the conversion now. Yeah, I'm not real uh, a big fan of that uh, throw the ball up and hope somebody that has a black shirt runs under it. Uh, Brennan lost it into the end zone and uh, almost makes a one-handed grab. It's been a sensational catch, but wasn't able to come up with it. Troy Scott, a 39-yarder. He is 50% on the season. Missed it. Troy Scott missed his first two a oh week boy. ago. Coach Stormy said he needs confidence. One of those guys that practice, he's great. But so far, Troy Scott has struggled come game time. And those are the plays you need, especially when you're trailing 14 to nothing. You got to have a spark. You got to, you know, a big kickoff return gets everybody pumped up. You bring it down to the 20, 25 yard line and can't get it in, can't get a score. A few of those uh, situations take all the heart out of you. So Utah State has the football. They are back in business again as they spot it on the 23. Matt Sock has one touchdown in the air, one on the ground. A little trickery, a toss. Oh, boy. And it is complete. You heard Jerry say blue is gone. Fumble, and the Vandals have it. 
Well, Blue got a little careless with the football, and Ryan Skinner came up with the gem. Well, how can a great play turn so disastrous for Utah State in a heartbeat? But it did. Blue comes out of the backfield, goes past the linebacker, and makes a nice catch, takes it downfield about 20, 25 yards, and then loses it right here. You see it on the, on the turf, on the rug. And the Vandals recover. Another big break for the Vandals. We had a 72-yard uh, kickoff return. Now we have a fumble recovery. We, the Vandals must score. One setback, two receivers, Wilson to the top of your screen, Price to the bottom. Brennan will run it. And that will complete the first quarter. Paint at Utah State 14, the Vandals nothing. We'll be back to the Kibbe Dome right after this. All right, as you watch the Vandals here, on second down, Jeff Caves tells us Demario Brown, who made the first play from scrimmage, is actually hurt. Actually, he's not hurt, Dave. He didn't practice this week because of a knee problem that bothered him earlier. He got scoped after the Utah game. You will see Demario Brown today, but sparingly. They don't want to get into him too much. So uh, back to you. Interesting what Jeff also told us during the break, Jerry, about uh, he didn't want to get in either one of those huddles. <laughs> he said, it's getting rough out there. Ryan Brent is, is not on the mark today. He's just off that much. And in a passing attack like this, you can't be off that much. A very, very emotional Idaho team. Uh, we were talking to my son, Matt, before the ball game, and he was saying that uh, the uh, team was talking last week. This week, there is no talking. The guys were ready to play, and there's a tremendous amount of emotion as we look at the first quarter stats. What about those passing yards, 132 to 50? A little lopsided. Update on the World Series. Cleveland up in the bottom of the second, two to nothing. Remember, if the Marlins win that, they capture the title. Brennan fires it. Antonio Wilson, not a good pass, but Wilson should have probably caught that one. You know, when you get that high emotionally, Dave, when you really, you know, your heart's racing and your adrenaline is flowing and you're, you're so hyped up, it's sometimes hard to have that precision throwing the ball. If up front in the offensive line, it doesn't matter. You're just whaling the big guys anyway, but the quarterback sometimes needs a little while to settle down. Again, Idaho is forced to boot it. Have another chance to back. It is at the one yard line. So the defense, the special teams, they've been doing it. The offense just needs to help out a little bit. Heads up, body uh, aware, awake football. Good, good execution on the defensive team. Some excellent moves by the punting team. Uh, they have their heads in the game. You can't do anything about it with that Aggie football team. I'll tell you what, Jeffrey Townsley is all over the place. He had the long kickoff return. Uh, a couple of good special teams plays. 15's making a name for himself here at Idaho. 44-yard boot. The Vandals push Utah State into the end zone. Let's see if they can hold them there. At least that's what Nick Holt, the defensive coordinator, is hoping. Blue will pick up uh, a couple of yards. Well, Utah State has definitely been able to run the football today. They've got a, a big, strong offensive line that, that the Vandals have been trying, like I said earlier in the broadcast, to take a shoulder or to take an edge or to shoot a gap or to play some stunt games up front to offset that big, experienced offensive line. But when you make a mistake, then you have a run like Blue made earlier. John Harper is in his defensive end position. He's been hurt throughout the season, but he's in there tonight. Number 46 for the Vandals. He wrapped up and held him blue, and then he let him go. Well, we highlight Harper, and he wrapped him up, but uh, and part of that is being rusty. Being a little rusty, maybe the, the ankle is bothering him a little bit more. If we look at John L. Smith on the sidelines. It's interesting. He never had that L in his name until he first started coaching here. There were a couple of John Smiths. He said, I better put the L, and I guess the rest is history. No one really knows what the L stands for. 
He knows, but he won't tell us. <laughs> His players at Utah State uh, said uh, Lucifer. Lucifer. <laughs> First and ten. Sock is going to throw it deep. Out of time. He's got a man open. Steve Smith, who has been the MVP, can he get in? Smith will jog in. Oh, how about that? 81 yards. Steve Smith from Matt Sock. And now it is 20 to nothing, and Utah State is putting on an offensive clinic. Sock has uh, plenty of time to throw the ball. You don't see any rush. You don't see any pressure. Sets back, steps up into the ball, throws it to Smith, and uh, the rest is history. 82 yards and another Aggie score. Jerry, what I'm wondering is maybe the Vandal defense was so zeroed in on the key at Jenkins that they forgot about Steve Smith. He certainly uh, wasn't the man that we were looking for. The uh, is, is supposed to have uh, Jenkins supposed to have 80% of the reception. Look at this. Another miss. Wow. Four on the season for the kicker, but I'll tell you what, the offense isn't missing. They lead it early in the second quarter, 20 to nothing. Back in the dome where Utah State leads it 20 to nothing. Mr. Smith has been the man, the receiver for Utah State. Three catches, 147 yards, a touchdown. And Jerry, you understood from the defensive backs coach at Idaho, they didn't even know anything about Steve Smith. They were going to double team Jenkins all day and uh, thought he was going to catch 80% of the passes. And so uh, Steve Smith was a, a known quantity. He had the speed, but they didn't anticipate him to catch this many balls as we see the uh, kickoff go in and out of the end zone. So the University of Idaho will operate on the 20. Do you question a little bit if you look at the numbers here on the Utah State scoring drive, do you question a little bit Brian Brennan or do you leave him in there? He is not as sharp as we have seen him. Brian has been exceptional throughout the season, but not tonight. He has not thrown the ball well to this point. Uh, we're going to leave him in this next series and, and see what happens, but he really has not thrown the ball well. Of course, the other side of that, you have to believe he's the guy that's gotten you this far. You have to stick with him. Brennan goes into the shotgun. There are his numbers. The big one, two interceptions. Brennan again under pressure. Makes something out of nothing. And your receivers, when you're not as sharp as we see Antonio Wilson drop a ball that normally he would catch, he's not getting the breaks for the time. Got a flag down. Looks like holding on the vandals. The uh, one of the things uh, Brian Brennan has tried to do is we saw him open up with the quick passes that would uh, one, two, three, bing, one, two, three, bing, and throw the ball very quickly. Anytime you take a little bit longer than that, that the uh, Aggie defensive line is putting pressure on him like they did that time, and he had to dance around and try to escape. Well, Jerry, this certainly Holding doesn't help matters. On the offense, half the distance to the goal from the spot of the foul, repeat, first down. Well, that's the worst part about holding is wherever it happens is where you get penalized from. So it really pushes it back. You can see it's on the six yard line. And it is first in a mile, about 24 if you're keeping track. Brennan keeps it on the ground. Anthony Tenner has nowhere to go. Jeff Caves on the sideline. Jeff, what do you have? I've been, I've been listening to George Yarno, the offensive coordinator, after these series have gone wrong, waiting for plays to be diagrammed, new strategies to be formed. He's got a very simple message. He says, gentlemen, they're doing nothing you haven't seen. You are not executing. You're not blocking. You're not running through your blocks. It's up to you from here. And he simply walks away and puts the hat on the heads of the players. Guys? Well, I, I think you can't say much more than that. They can coach all they want, but you've got to play. This time, nearly picked off. Well, we thought Deion Price had it for a second, and then the defender, Vashon Garman, nearly had the third interception of the game for Utah State. Vashon Garman has already had two. And, uh, it looks like he almost got it. He, he had his hand on it and almost had a third. Dion needs to fight for that ball a little bit more. Be, that's his ball. 
Yondell Carter, a couple of INTs, Vashon trying to get in the mix. Third down and long for the Vandals. Third down has not been a good number for Idaho. As Brandon hangs it high, he has a man. There is a flag on the play. Antonio Wilson couldn't get to the ball. Let's see if it is interference. It looked like maybe the receiver bumped the defender on that play. Got isolation on this shot. Couldn't see anything there. It, it is pass interference against the Aggies. So a big break for the Idaho Vandals, especially on third and 24. It's not likely there's many plays in the book for third and 24. <laughs> pass interference on the defense. 15-yard penalty from the previous spot and an automatic first down. Good thing it was an automatic first down. We needed another 10 yards to get to the first down marker. But it's first down Vandals. And was that a third down conversion, Jerry? That's, I think, the first one we've seen tonight. I don't think that counts. Vandals. Look at this bootleg. Slide. Look at this bootleg. Good play by Brian Brennan, who normally isn't known as a scrambler, slides and picks up big yards. 17 yards for the senior, Lacey Washington. And I asked Brian, I said, has anybody ever told you you look like Scott Linehan in that hat? And he says, no, no one's told me that, but Scott Linehan did recruit me to come here and play. Tony Tenner makes an excellent fake into the line. The defensive end buys it. The uh, linebacker on that side buys it. And Brian goes around the end zone <laughs> all by himself for about 18. You know, Brian said he was close to playing baseball, and that slide looked pretty good to me. <laughs> looked like he's going into third. In fact, is some of the coaches here had to talk him out of baseball and say, football is your game. Glennon gets the first down and keeps the drive alive. Play action. Oh, yeah. Look out. Vashon Garman was not fooled by all the play action and the trickery. Or we shouldn't say trickery so much as trying to hide the football. And you can see how frustrated Brian Brennan is. The Vashon Garman's playing cornerback. And normally he's blitzing. It has to be blitzing to be in the backfield like that. And that's kind of a dangerous thing for a, a defensive team. But John L. has blitzed him two or three times from the corner. And uh, he's been very effective. So a loss of eight yards. Second down at 18. See the time remaining in the half. Coming again. Brennan. Brennan gets it off. And Antonio Wilson cannot get it. But right now, the receivers, the court, everybody's off track for the University of Idaho. And Garman was a step away from sacking the quarterback again, uh, coming off the other corner this time. Jerry Idaho's back in that slot again where they're faced with a third and long. 18 yards, they need to get the first down. Dust off the old pass interference play again. Now they need to get it past the midfield mark. Utah State already with three sacks in this game. And you know they'll be sending everyone on this third down. It's Jerome Thomas in motion. Brennan gets it off to Antonio Wilson. Wilson almost gets up to the original line of scrimmage, and the Vandals will have to punt the football. Too big a hole. Just two, uh, third and 24, third and 20, third and 18. The, the conversion's impossible from that range, virtually impossible. Mike O'Neill set to boot it from his 24-yard line, and the dangerous Steve Smith will wait for the football. Smith will come up and catch it at the 26. Smith still on his feet. He's got some room along the sidelines. And Smith has been everywhere as he runs it up to the 41-yard line. Now, Smith looked like when he caught this ball, he was stopped. But he made something out of nothing. In fact, he turns it into a pretty big play. And we might note that Utah State is one of the best in the Big West in punt return. And right now, they're the best on the field in Moscow, leading it 20 to nothing. Back at the Kibbe Dome, where the University of Idaho Vandals are in danger of losing their first game in this building, 
uh, since November 13th. That goes back to 1993. 21-game home winning streak on the line. And Matt Sock is the man that's engineering that so far. Six of 10, 213 yards, two touchdowns as the quarterback for Utah State all in the first half. Well, Arnold Gunn nearly had the interception, but you can credit that to Ryan Skinner, who came from his middle linebacker position and put a hit on Matt Sock. Trying to get a little, trying to get a little pressure on uh, Matt Sock. Watch Skinner come from the left corner, and is a step short of uh, sacking the quarterback. But they have to get some pressure on Sock. Been able to stand back there and throw the ball with not much pressure. Now three receivers split out to the bottom of your screen. You can see two of them in the slot. And they give it off to Melvin Blue, and Blue has nowhere to run. So a nice play by the Idaho defense, and leading the charge is Nick, Nick Alexikos. Watch Melvin Blue, the big running back for Utah State, heads left, and you see Alexikos and... Uh, our young uh, man from Lewiston take care of business. Good swarm tackle there. Well, we'll see what Idaho can do on third down and fairly long. Let's see if the crowd will help them like they did in the first quarter. Stop. Gets it off. Nakia Jenkins is open and another catch. Nakia has one man to be touchdown. 59 yards. Jerry, it looks like a replay of the Steve Smith touchdown. Had pressure, had pressure up front. Tim Wilson uh, putting a little pressure on, but again, this this is a fine football player, Nakia Jenkins. He uh, has had a wonderful career so far with Utah State and adds to it with this reception. Two touchdowns. All in this ball game on the season, he has four. So that's his uh, what? What's he matched his season in? Uh, what a quarter and a half, about a half. A lot of time left in this football game. Utah State going for two after missing the extra point again. Sock back to pass. He's been brilliant back there. And there's Jenkins wide open. The home crowd growing unfriendly as they look at the scoreboard 28 to nothing with 10 minutes to go in the first half. Well, Jerry when this thing started out it was back and forth back and forth we had commented we in for a great football game and then all of a sudden a couple of turnovers Utah State just took over from there and the deep passing game of Utah State looks tough. Tremendous. Uh, Smith has had a wonderful night as, as has Jenkins. They have both uh, run at will through the uh, Vandal secondary. Uh, those turnovers were big turnovers. They kind of turned the emotional tide, and gave the uh, Utah State team a lift, and uh, and it took something out of the Vandals. They, they pinned them down a couple times on the goal line and held them the first eight, 10 minutes of the ball game scoreless, and a couple turnovers and a couple quick scores, and this game's about to get out of hand. See Chris Tormey working the sidelines. How tough does this have to be for him? You've got to be a cheerleader at this point, don't you? Or do you have to chew your chew up on your players a little bit? You really do. I mean, it, 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 this could get away from us completely here. We've got to have a, a little chat with the boys, regroup and gather ourselves, get it back together. So Utah State will be kicking off again. You see a very effective scoring drive for the Aggies. And that was on a third and long. Looked like uh, the Vandals had good pressure. Next thing you know, you're down 28 love. Jerome Thomas takes it at the 22. Still on his feet, spinning and turning, and gets it up to the 36-yard line. So the Vandals have had the spark plays, but they just can't seem to ignite the engine. Nine minutes, 50 seconds remaining in the first half. Jerome Thomas was the man who stepped in for Joel Thomas when he was injured in the first game of the season. Injured his knee. Out for the year. Anthony Tenner came in as well. 
but the Vandals aren't worried about the running game now. They've got to get it in the air, and that's why there's five receivers in this particular package. Brennan out of the shotgun. Under pressure. Brennan dancing. Willie Alderson catches the football. The young man from Napa High School makes his first grab of the game. Willie on the season with his 17th catch. Alderson uh, cuts to the inside, and now that you saw the quarterback scramble, he makes a great adjustment here, moves around, finds an open spot, and goes down and gets the ball. Alder nice catch. Alderson showing some of his 4 5 40 speed. Joel Thomas, I asked him about Willie. He said, I wished I was that fast. Brennan on first down goes to work in a hurry. And this time, Alderson can't bring it down. Just a little bit high. Catchable ball was there. Could have been caught, but was a little high. Alderson earlier this season sprained his ankle. He said, I'm just getting to be 100%. Uh, tough catch. Brennan, 7 of 19, 71 yards, two interceptions. That is not uh, the stats that you'd want to see as a Vandal quarterback. Second down and 10, Brennan fires. Throw the flag. No flag. Now, Deion Price is asking that same question. He felt like he was pushed. Brian Brennan saying, what do I need? Nope, he needs a completion. A, a few fans on the sideline were bending their boos also watch this looked to me like it might have been interference although he was may have been out of bounds too it may not have been a catchable ball certainly the defensive back got there ahead of the ball handles on third down tonight one of six converting Brennan fires this yeah. time he's got it as Deion Price turns it and he run out of bounds at the 26 yard line Deion Price, the guy who can catch and run with it, averages 16 yards of reception. Nice move to the inside. Well-thrown ball this time to the outside. He just catches it, turns around, takes off. Nicely thrown ball that time by Brian. First spark we've seen for a while from the home team. As Jerome Thomas heads out of the lineup, Anthony Tenner replaces him at the tailback spot. Ryan Brennan tries to pop one in the end zone. Tanner finds a little hole, cuts up, and Tanner with a nice run gets it to the 13 yard line on the first down. Anthony Tanner, of course, come in for Joel Thomas about four or five games ago, makes some nice moves, got some speed, cuts back up the middle. Gains about 12 yards, first down Vandal. Last week he rushed for 93 yards. Talking about trouble with third down conversions. This is where the Vandals have struggled this season, is inside the 20, what they call the red zone. They can't just seem to score the football. Tenner with it. He's going in. Touchdown! So the Vandals finally get it into the end zone at the 837 mark of the first half. Tremendous individual effort there. He broke uh, a couple tackles and made some moves all by himself out on the corner. Let's take a look at it again as he comes to the left of your screen to his right. Breaks the tackle right there. Makes a move here. Goes back out. Comes inside. Takes it across the goal line. Great run. 14-yard touchdown for the Idaho Vandals who finally get on the board. Troy Scott hustling out for the extra point. Trying to pull his team within 21. And it's good. Got it. Well, a big play for the Idaho Vandals. Uh, leading the way was Mr. Tanner. Four rushes, 28 yards, and a 14-yard touchdown that has them yelling in the dome. Well, the Vandals finally get on the board 28 to 7. That one goes six plays, covering 65 yards. And, of course, a nice run by Anthony Tanner, who Vandal fans are hoping to see a lot of in the years to come, the 14-yard trot. And that's where it stands. Jerry Kramer, you made the point. There's a lot of time left. 
not only in the game, but in this second frame. In the second quarter. Scott will boot it. We know how dangerous this man is. Even when somebody seems to hit him, he still gets it up to the 20-yard line. Throw the flag. Jerry, that's what I like having you up here. It's almost like you're down there playing. <laughs> I get a little excited ah. about it. I get a little excited now about it. That's what we Again, like. Here's the, uh, here's the return man, uh, Smith, who uh, comes up the middle, gets hit right here, gets away from it. Good leg drive, good movement, stays with it. Uh, dangerous football player. So Matt Sock comes in. Idaho gets the touchdown. He's going to put it up, trying to answer the call. Complete. And the guy by the name of London McBride runs it deep into Idaho territory. He pushes that one all the way up to the 40. 40 yard reception. Well, Matt Sock is tying his shoe, but that's about all he's slowing down for. <laughs> Again, uh, no pressure at all. Watch uh, Sock as he stands in the pocket, takes the time, pumps a couple times, and uh, beautiful pass right on the button. Nice reception. Bryson Gardner was there to make the stop, but not before the big game. As Utah State moves it into Vandal territory. Sock with three. Receivers. Single setback is blue, and that's him getting away from the defender. Good play. Nice play by the defense. So it looked like it was going to be a case where Ryan LaPointe was not going to be able to hang on to blue, but he just did bring him down by the shirt tail. Hung on just enough to slow him down and finally bring him down. Nice play by Ryan LaPointe. LaPointe moving into that starting role in place of the injured John Harper. Those two have been back and forth in this football contest. Puts it at the maybe a pickup of a yard. Still going to be second and long for Utah State. Sock again to put it up. Oh, he got it. You get it? Yeah. Arnold Gunn grabs it. Gunn read that one from start to finish. It was almost like he baited Matt Sock into throwing the toss, and Sock was perfect to this point. Intercepted, and here come the Vandals. Big play, big play. Again, we're trying to game up front, get a little pressure. No pressure, and at the last minute, Gunn steps in front and picks it off and just barely stays in bounds. But a wonderful defensive play. So here come the Vandals with the football at the 33. Tanner is the single setback, takes the football. And he has nowhere to go. As Lindsey Hassel makes the stop. Lindsey's dad played at Weber State. And that brings memories of John L. Smith, who played his ball at Weber State. John L's been around the Big Sky Conference, the Big West Conference, the WAC, the Pac-10. Been around. But it seems as if he's found a home in Logan, Utah. And he's at his home away from home here, leading 28 to 7, but the Vandals are on the move. Brennan fires complete. Price, and he is tossed to the turf. But Price makes the grab, and that's what the receivers need to do right now, Jerry, is make those catches, even if they are five, six yards a pop. Exactly right. And even if they are a little high or a little bit behind it, they have to catch the ball. Brian's starting to settle down a little bit, throwing the ball on rhythm, on target. Bingo, right on the numbers. Nice reception. Uh, nine yards, third and one. One and a quarter, one and a half. Handles two of seven on third down. Conversions, trying to improve that number. They need to get it to the 43. This is Tanner fighting his way. I don't think he got it. Close. Depends on where they mark the yeah. football, as always. But I think he's just about a... Yeah, I think you're right, David. He's a little short. Half yard. Now it definitely is decision time as far as do you go for it on fourth down. You've got to believe if you're going to win this game, your team's got to give you not even a half a yard. It is very close to a first down, but I believe from here, from our angle anyway, it looks short. 
I believe I'd have to go for it. I am uh, I'm a generally a pretty conservative uh, football player or assistant coach but uh, we're down 28 to 7 and we need a break and we need a little lift and uh, here comes the punter. <laughs> Well, you know, Idaho's not scared to run the fake punt either. Of course, John L. Smith knows that. And you can hear the crowd a little bit saying, go for it, go for it, trying to use the momentum of the interception. Of course, you also have to look at it. If you don't make it, then you're really in deep trouble. You got, you got a lot of time. There's a lot of time left in the football game. Five minutes, 34 seconds in the second quarter, still remaining, plus the whole second half. And this is a... A volatile football team. They can score at any time. So, a lot of time left. Mike O'Neill's been averaging 50 yards a punt in this ball game. He's been very busy as a punt. Special teams for Idaho on the punt coverage has been exceptional. But this is not one of those exceptional boots. It'll take a Utah State bounce to the 27 yard line, and that's where the Aggies will take over. Trying to get Jim McGraw. What was that, Jerry? I was going to say he was trying to get that one out of bounds. He was looking for the sideline a little bit. Just didn't hit it well. well. I'd have to say, we, as I mentioned, when he booted it, give the special teams an A on the punt cover. They've done a wonderful job. Yeah, they have. They really have been exceptional. So Matt Sock back out there. Last time he was on the artificial surface throwing the interception. Keeps it on the ground of Melvin Blue. And Blue's got a lot of running room. So we certainly thought Demario Brown was the marquee man. And Melvin Blue has been carrying the ball more and more for Utah State. And that time he picks up 18 yards. But when you can pick up 18 yards a pop on the ground, it certainly helps the passing. It makes things easier for Matt Sock. Two things. We're gaming a little bit up front. We're guessing. We're looping a little bit. And we get caught every now and then. And you've got a great offensive line with the Utah State football team. And just about old Jerry Kramer could run behind them right now. First down's going to hang it up deep to guess who, and guess who's wide open? Nakia Jenkins. He can get open on just about anybody. As Bryson Gardner was back there, Ryan McGinnis, they were back there, but they were watching him, Nakia, run away from him. Just slightly overthrown that time. There's a good reason to make the switch to Channel 6 ABC Saturday nights following Channel 6 News at 10 o'clock. Two new programs have premiered that have had a lot of people talking and watching. At 10.30, following Channel 6 News, Stacy Keach is back as the hard-boiled detective in an all-new episode of Mike Hammer, Private Eye. Stay tuned for that tonight on Channel 6. Hammer, Mr. Blue has been hammering the battle defense as he picks up another first down. Melvin, that's about all that's slowing him down today. Tying a shoelace. <laughs> well, how do you stop him? What are your ideas? Well, they've been trying to uh, game a little bit up front, like we talked about, taking the edges, uh, looping the defensive tackles, trying to uh, confuse the blocking assignments, the offensive line. Take a gamble when you do that. And uh, if, you, if you're lucky, you'll stop him at the line of scrimmage. If you don't, that time it worked. That time we were lucky. That time it worked very well. Melvin Blue with 114 yards rushing. Mike Roberg coming up to make that stop. And there the Vandal defense stopped Blue. Got through right here, right in the hole, in the backfield. Stopped him for about a two-yard loss. Garner Moody was also there to help out with Roberg. Sock, who's having a great Right now, he's got game numbers, let alone first half numbers. Yeah. So we've got a timeout on the field. Timeout, Utah State. That is their first timeout of the half. You can hear Utah State taking the timeout, their first timeout of the half. Matt Sock with the numbers and with the news, our weekend crew, Jill Rickett, Hey, Foch, and... 
our own Joe Hughes, who was a busy man for Bronco football game today. Heartbreaking loss for Boise State at home. He'll have all the highlights of that game. Jill Rickett with the latest news happenings. And Dave will have your weekend weather, which, uh, believe it or not, is about uh, ready to wrap up the weekend. Doesn't seem like it is, but uh, that's the case. Here's what happened today. Louisiana Tech with that win over the Broncos. Does not affect Boise State in the Big West picture. Still 2-0, tied now with Nevada after that impressive win by the Pack over North Texas, 65-10. New Mexico State leading Arkansas State, 13-6. And here it is 28 to 7 Utah State with the lead and Jeff Caves down on the sidelines. Yeah, you know, I've been going back and forth, Dave, and uh, it's just an emotional roller coaster on the University of Idaho sideline. What a test of wills and emotions between a very big time prideful group of kids and equally pride coaches who don't want to hammer them too much, but yet have to challenge them to respond on the Utah State sideline. What a confident group of guys who know they have this game in control. It's going to be a fascinating second half to see who has really has to dig down deep and, and really come through. Guys? Well, maybe we can send Jeff into the locker room. <laughs> he said it is rough and tumble there. I think Good Utah play. State Hold was on. trying to run a reverse there. Hopefully we can see that on the replay because it looked to me, Jerry, like Melvin Blue was actually going to hand that football off. I believe he was trying to hand it off and uh, couldn't get it done inside to keep it. You need to remember, too, that we have 29 freshmen or sophomores out on the field. Jeff was talking about the veteran uh, uh, Aggie football team, and you mentioned the offensive line and the all Big West three of them last year. So you got a mature football team against a kind of a young football team. Vandals calling on the crowd to make them a little older on third and long. Matt Sock is having trouble hearing here in the dome. And I don't think he got it off in so. time. So that'll be a penalty against Utah State. And you can compliment the crowd on that one. Five yards for the crowd. Five yards if you're keeping <laughs> score. Prior to the snap, delay of game on the offense. Five-yard penalty, still third down. Of course, Jerry Kramer never had the pleasure of playing in this building. No, we they didn't played. have domes then, did they, Jerry? They didn't have a dome anywhere <laughs> in the country at that point in time. And a big field house here that was a little bit drafty, but we spent most of our time outdoors. Well, here comes the crowd again as they tack five and make it third and 60. And again, another flag. Now the question is, did somebody jump? Did the Vandals go past the line of scrimmage? Give the five back? We will find out. The Vandals have got two, to the snap, two down full linemen. Start on the offense. Five-yard penalty, still third down. The Vandals are using two down linemen and three uh, linebackers, maybe defensive end, that are jumping back and forth in front of the center and from guard to guard and trying to confuse the Aggie offense. And so far, it's it's uh, upset them a little bit and caused a little confusion. The penalties are. Utah State, four for 30 yards. Idaho, three for 10 29. Pretty, pretty even in the penalty department. A mix up in the backfield. Sox going to be sacked. No, it gets away. Flag down. And it's going to be in the neighborhood of holding. It's an incomplete pass. The question is, Jerry, is if we're guessing it's holding, would you push him back even further, or do you tell him to punt the football and decline it? His sock was roughed up a little bit. Watch Matt Jasic on this play. Sack or nearly sack. There, yeah, there was a little mix-up there between sock and blue. Here comes Jasic and has him for a moment. Gets away and throws a holding long pass downfield. On the offense. But it is a holding Hell call against the Aggies. Down. And I would decline it. That sure is a noisy official down there, isn't it? <laughs> They're talking over me all day. So Utah State will punt the football. Two minutes and 13 seconds left. Let's get the ball and see what we do with it. Well, we'll boot it. On his 34. Is he going to fake it? Yeah. How about that? Who would have thought he was going to fake it? I don't know that it was 
actually a, a, a planned fake, Dave. That snap was a little high, and they've been having a little problem over the last couple weeks with, with the snapper. So that may have been a desperation run. Let's now, it doesn't hurt them, Utah State, in the sense nope. that uh, they didn't nope. get it that deep. Antonio Wilson makes a nice play here. Well, it looked like there wasn't a, a, a potential block there, and Wilson makes a, a great move there to, to save the, the ball for the Vandals. Knock them out of bounds before they're able to get the first down. But it's not I, like I you're punting deep in your own territory yeah. and hurt Utah State. Brennan trying to get something going with two minutes to go. He's going to scramble himself and run at the other direction. I think I'd have to see that punt one more time to make up my mind whether that was a planned uh, fake punt or whether he was forced into it. But in any event, uh, Brennan picks up seven. And the Vandals are going without a huddle, obviously, in their two-minute offense. Plenty of time. And wide open is Antonio Wilson. And Wilson does the wise thing, makes the catch, and then goes out of bounds to stop the clock. Excellent protection by the Vandal offensive line that time. Brennan had plenty of time. So Brian Brennan with the toss picks up 19, keeps the drive going. Chris Tormey thinking we need a touchdown before we go into that locker room. Brennan is limping a little bit. Looks like he might have uh, a slight strain or something. He's going to stay in the ball game, but he's not quite as mobile as he was a moment ago. See the numbers on Antonio. Look for him to maybe catch it here. He is Brennan's favorite target. And there is what you talked about, his mobility. And that time, it really affected him trying to get away from the defender. And he will take a timeout. I think he actually got hurt on that first scramble. I think so, too. Dave. Timeout, Idaho. That is their second timeout of the half. That wasn't yeah. where he got hurt. That was no. a couple of plays ago. Just uh, did seem to be restricted a little bit in his movement, his mobility. That was the last play we just saw. But he was injured a couple plays before that. Something to his ankle and wasn't able to move well. I'm telling you, this Vandal football team isn't about to quit. There's still a lot of heart here and there's still a lot of emotion. And these kids are still going to play football. Now, Brian Brennan's in there with George Yardle, the offensive coordinator. There are the standings in the Big West. Broncos at 2-0. Next week, they will take on Utah State, Nevada at 2-0. And Idaho, the scenario of this one, Jerry, you've got to believe if they lose, they are out of the Big West Conference title race. To have any chance at all to play in the humanitarian bowl, bowl in Boise, they have to win this football game. Uh, it's going to be pretty dim if they don't. There's still a mathematical chance, but it's a uh, chance that has to be carried out several decimal points. Well, you can see Brian Brennan has not given up on this one. He is ready to go, trying to keep everyone fired up. The Vandals get ready to head to Cheney against a tough Eastern Washington team that upset the uh, University of Montana a week ago. Then they have the break. And then New Mexico State in the season finale against the Broncos, which we will have for you right here on Channel 6, the end of November. Brennan faced with a second and long. Hangs it up, and nearly making the grab was Jeffrey Townsley. I thought Townsley was going to pull that one out of the sky. It looked like it. Awfully close. Townsley made a lot of noise in the first quarter, but we haven't heard much of him since. Townsley uh, run a little comeback, and then he's sliding, and almost makes the reception. The ball was tipped, of course, and he was going for the ball, had his eyes on it, and made the move one more time. Uh, oh, he thought he had it, too. He thought he had it. He started to bring it into his chest. Townsley wanted to play quarterback here at the University of Idaho. They said, we need a receiver. Right now, Brennan's our quarterback. Fires it up. He has a man taking the grab. How about that? Antonio Wilson, I think he did that with one hand what and a, a whole lot of stick -up. What a great catch. I don't know how he caught that ball. What a great catch. Didn't look like it was possible to be caught from the from up here. See if he did it with Watch one hand. His. Watch his left hand. Oh, what a great catch. What a great effort. Timeout, Utah State. That is their second timeout of the half. So the Aggies using the timeout to regroup. There is Chris Tormey. 
with Brian Brennan. George Yarno, as we pointed out, in the beer. He had a, a brother that was a pretty good football player here. John. John was a fabulous center. Great football player. Uh, uh, quite a bit better than pretty good. He's a great football player. This football team is uh, starting to get pumped up again. You know, when you get a couple breaks going your way, the Vandals score here, and we've got a pretty good football game in the second half. Both of these teams are high-scoring football teams, and there's going to be a lot more scoring before this game's over. Think we can hear anything in this huddle? <laughs> Let's listen. backs how that means that's the number of uh, defensive backs you have there. well depending upon your passing situation you know, sometimes like to put in extra pass defenders and you sometimes like to put in uh, a linebacker or two that uh, may drop back and pass protection uh, so there's several packages Dave and that, that they're so dramatically different nowadays that uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him put in 11 defensive backs and linebackers at some point. Brandon 11 of 25, 144 yards, two intercepts. But he's starting to come on in the latter moments of the first half. Looks one way, is going to run it. Fires. And there will be a flag. Jeffrey Townsley was the man, and all over his back was the defender, Bashar Levingston. So a good play by Brian Brennan to look to his right, look like he was going to scramble and then try and thread the needle. Makes a nice fake out to his right, comes back, has some running room, decides to throw the ball. Interference by the defensive back. Townsley was in position. Def defensive back got there a little early. Didn't give him an opportunity to catch the ball. Both teams with one timeout, the Vandals have to be careful with the clock on the defense 15 yard penalty from the previous spot and an automatic first down 104 remains so clock management is the secret right now and that is a difficult thing for a team to master and it uh, is especially a problem for a young football team you can get excited and totally lose control of the clock and your emotions out there Lucky Ahi, a young man from Lewiston, is in uh, as a fullback. Jerome Thomas is in. Brandon fires and nearly intercepted. As Antonio Wilson had the ball carom off him. And uh, Utah State re defenders weren't really watching, but they may have picked that off if they were paying attention. I think that went right through his hands and hit him in the head. Watch this. Comes back, turns. Boop. It does. It goes absolutely right through his hands and hits him right in the helmet. You won't see that very often. That's an excellent receiver. Very unusual to have that happen to a guy. That's a, that's a once in a lifetime play. Antonio Wilson keeps his 19 game receiving streak alive. Not with that play, but with a reception earlier. Brian Brennan making an adjustment at the line, and now he uses that last time out. Not sure if that's where he wanted to use it, but uh, didn't like what was going on and I'm sure the coaching staff said Brian we only have one save it those uh, that incident with Antonio Wilson is what makes coaches get gray hair here's one of your great receivers he makes a nice move turns to catch the ball and for some inexplicable reason the ball goes right through his hands and hits him in the helmet drive you nuts well Jerry I'm gonna put you in the in the headset there where Chris Stormy is what kind of play would you call here well, we got 59 seconds left, and we're out of timeout. Uh, seven yards. I guess I'd have to throw the ball. We're second down, so we got three downs to get in the end zone, and I'd like to throw the ball in the end zone. If uh, if the ball passes incomplete, the clock stops. We got plenty of time. 
And you could actually do, you could run it. You've got plenty of time to do anything you want to do. You got three plays. You know, a pass play will take five, six, seven seconds, depending upon the play. But we've got plenty of time here to score. There is John L. Smith on the sidelines. Left Idaho, January 3rd of 1995. One of my favorite stories, John L. was skiing in McCall. He was at Brundage when he was on the chairlift, and there was a page for a John Smith. Turned out to be the athletic director at Utah State. Now, how did they track him down? <laughs> skiing, one of the John L. Smith's favorite sports, skiing. Brennan on the keeper, fires it, oh incomplete. Well, we had a little bit of everything there. Thought there was going to be a reverse, then we thought maybe Brennan would tuck it, and fires it into Antonio Wilson, 54 seconds on the clock, and it brings up a second down. Make it third down. Uh, Brian Brennan has some room here. If he decides to run right here, he might have a shot at it, but uh, wisely throws it to the wide receiver, Antonio Wilson, who has a hand on it, but can't hold on to it. Could be a big turning point in the ball game. Obviously, the Vandals are 21 points down, but if they score here just before the half, could be a big lift. Ball is at the seven. Brennan under pressure, gets it off. Pankratz was the intended receiver, but he did not have an opportunity to get it, and Coach Tormey is going to send the field goal unit out. Well, you definitely do not want to leave this situation without putting something on the scoreboard. You really need a score here, desperately need a score. The Vandals need a score to go into halftime and convince themselves they can come out and win this game in the second half. Troy Scott is 10 of 21 on the season. It'll be a 23 yarder. Scott boots it. And he got it. Well, Jerry, it's not a touchdown, but it adds three more to the board and makes it 28 to 10 with 46 seconds to go. And I guess what you've got to be careful of is, you know, Coach Smith is going to come right back firing when he gets the football. <laughs> Boy, we got to get that referee to hold, hold it down a little bit. He keeps yelling when you're talking. Uh, you think he's not a Parma fan? I don't know. I think I'm... he goes to Glens Ferry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Glens Ferry will be a tough task. Of course, a year ago, Parma defeating Glens Ferry for the state championship, the A3 title. Fruitland's going to be battling in there at home day. Amen. We got them all on Sports Plus. Utah State, look out for the Aggies. Oh my. Yeah, that's what they're wondering is what is going on at the Aggies. Get the football, and Bashar Levingston is just a safety man, an up man, just darts along the sidelines and gets the big return up to the 18-yard line. And if you're scoring at home, that was a 72-yard return. How did he get loose in I there? I don't know exactly how that happened. Uh, it looked like the ball bounced along the turf like it was almost a squib kick, and the Vandal defense kind of let up and Evans just kept dancing and kept prancing down the sidelines and brings it back 72 yards. Puts the uh, Aggies on the 18 yard line. With 39 seconds remaining in this half. Sock on the roll. Just shovels it in. And Galermo Chavez gets out of bounds. I got the ball. Good job. Way to help him. Way to try to help him. Chavez with his second reception of the evening. <laughs> and a shoveled that one into him. 33 clicks on the clock. Utah State still has a timeout left. <laughs> really takes the momentum away of what you did with the field goal. Kia <laughs> Jenkins in motion. And he'll be running in the corner. Oh, nearly oh. intercepted. Garner Moody, it looked almost as if he was the receiver. He had a chance, had a chance. He was back in coverage. Watch him. Sock throws it right here. You couldn't see it, but Garner Moody had his hands on it. It almost came up with the interception. And he's feeling bad about it right now. Take another look from the end zone. Right here. Uh, uh. Well, he's wearing a number of a receiver. Maybe Matt Sock uh, had 87 confused with his 87. You can hear the crowd on third down. Blue gets up to the one-yard line. He is 
a punishing running back. We were guessing again up front. All five defensive linemen or defensive people were bouncing back and forth, uh, jumping in and out and back up and down the line and guessing, and they ran right up the middle on us on a uh, draw and got to the one. Doc will just throw it down in the dirt. And the reason he did that was to stop the clock, get his play call. They're conserving that timeout. With 21 seconds on the clock. Here's the long keep run. Keep by your eye on the defensive. No, you couldn't see him. The defensive line here. They were dancing all over the place and gaming and guessing like we've uh, explained all evening. And they got caught going the wrong way. And blue just goes right up the middle of the one yard line. Virtually untouched. So they got tackled. Speaking of dancing all around. Blue is doing the two step to perfection. Matt Sock with 313 yards, Gary, in this first half. Wow. And uh, Demario Brown isn't missed all that much right now. Football is spotted at the one. Sock on the keeper gets in for the touchdown. So with 16 seconds remaining in the half, Matt Sock calls his own number. Ironically enough, seven goes in for six. Well, all the momentum was stolen away from the Vandals on that long kickoff returning. You can see all the folks that made the trip from Logan, Utah to cheer on the Aggies. Now the extra point goes through, so with 17 seconds to go as we projected, Utah State did not slow it down one bit, and they lead it 35 to nothing. 17 seconds remaining. Jerry Kramer, you're shaking your head. You're disappointed in your old school right now. Well, it's so, you know, the, the drive down the field, the field goal, and you get your uh, heart pumping a little bit and uh, think you have a chance to come back and maybe get in the ball game. And... Uh, you dribble a kickoff down the field to the 10 yard line and uh, should have had excellent coverage on the kickoff and we run it back 72 yards. So that's disappointing. Five plays on that drive. Utah State used the clock very well. Brian Skinner catches it almost like a center fielder. And the clock will stop at 12 seconds. And you wonder if Brian Brennan is getting words of going down on one knee or maybe tossing it deep. Run silent, run deep. It's not out of the ordinary for these two programs to fire it deep like that. Fact is, that's part of the offense. Yeah, we got we got a couple shots at it. Then got 12 seconds. I, I would I would throw it down the field, especially at 35 and 10. Well, six defensive backs in the game for Utah State. They will rush three, and that's the end of the first half. The crowd is silent here in the Kibbe Dome. John L. Smith has kind of made it a homecoming for him to remember as his club leads it 35 to 10 at the half. It's 35 to 10 here at the Kibbe Dome, just about ready to start the second half. I was in the Utah State locker room and had an opportunity to listen to the way John L. Smith has prepared this football team to come back in the second half and try to break the winning streak of the Vandals here at home. Every single one of those Aggies players is very aware that the second longest home winning streak in college football could come to an end. John L. Smith had them whipped up to a frenzy. I wasn't allowed in the locker room. I wasn't allowed within 10 yards of the locker room, and I could hear one man saying one thing, do not relax, go for the throat. These guys came out motivated. Now, the offensive yards have, have piled up. It'll be interesting to see. Dave? All right, Jeff, so no sign of calling off the dogs as the Vandals will kick it off here in the second half, trailing 35 to 10. They've got to try to figure out some way to get something going defensively and offensively and on special teams. Once again, almost a carbon copy, Jerry Kramer, of what we saw, Bashar Livingston carrying the football up to midfield, and that certainly gives your offense a big break. It was the... Uh... 
only about a 30 yard return this time instead of a 72 yard return but it was uh, almost a replay so after the 43 yard run back puts it up near the big eye and you can see it one more time one it's the time. blocking and the running good blocking good lead block up front and uh, missed tackles or just really not wrapping up well Matt, Livingston brings it out to the 50. Matt Sock, who is having a resume night back at the helm for Utah State, gives it off to Melvin Blue, and Blue has nowhere to go, but there is a flag on the play. 14-45, just underway here in the third quarter. Dave Tester, along with former Vandal, former Green Bay Packer great, Jerry Kramer, thrilled to have him in the broadcast booth, as well as Jeff Cage. You can see the illegal procedure against Utah State. Illegal procedure on the offense. Six men on the line of scrimmage. The penalty is declined. Second down. Good swarm by the Vandal defense that time. Uh, if that's any indication of their attitude and the way they're going to play in the second half, that was a, a wonderful move to the ball by the, the entire defense. Brings up a second down and 11, as Jeff Caves indicated. John L. Smith was yelling in the locker room at halftime. You can bet it was the same kind of noise over in the Vandal locker room. Sock fires it up. Guillermo makes the grab more than enough. Fumble. Fumble. And it is picked up by the Idaho Vandals. And the beanbags come out from everywhere. A big play by Bryson Gardner. Oh, well, he has an interception. Now he has the fumble recovery. And the Vandals get a break early on in the second half. I guess the question is, Jerry, who made the big hit? Who made the big hit? Who got the ball? Nice catch. Oh, it just uh, pulled his arm away. It's Skinner. Ryan Skinner. Skinner uh, made the tackle and pulled the, pulled the arm away, and the ball just popped free. Something the Vandals didn't do in the first half was capitalize on turnovers. Let's see if they can do it here in the third quarter. Trailing 35 to 10. Brennan fires it at complete. That is the kind of Idaho offense fans here are used to seeing. Antonio Wilson goes up for the grab, and the Vandals are on the move after the 16-yard reception. I just can't help but uh, wonder if John L. Smith's locker room was uh, in a frenzy. What was Chris Tormey's locker room like? I suppose he had a few comments in there. Antonio Wilson from Brennan. Nice inside slant move. Catches the ball. First down. Back to live action. Oh. Incomplete pass as Brian Brennan was trying to get it to Antonio Wilson. Now you could tell when we talked to Chris Tormey heading into the locker room, he was not a happy man. He was not pleased with how the club played last week in a sense. They moved the football up and down the field. They couldn't get it into the end zone. Tonight, just a case of too many mental mistakes. Mental mistakes. Actually, Idaho had 46 plays in the first half to Utah's 40. But the yardage difference was uh, completely one-sided. Give on the ground. That's Jerome Thomas trying to turn the corner, but there was no corner to turn because Tony Diamato, the Big West Defensive Player of the Week, was there to wrap him up. So Chiarno replaying, or I should say relaying, the play to Brian Brennan, who grew up idolizing Dan Marino. The Dan Marino S comeback here. 13 25 here in the third quarter. Brennan and company trailing Utah State. Another big third down. Brennan from the shotgun. Fires Got across it. the middle. And the attended receiver was Ryan Prestamonico. And Prestamonico is normally a very effective receiver. Not that he should have caught that ball, but. We have not called his number tonight. Haven't seen him at all. In fact, that's the first time we've uh, had the ball close to him in my memory. And uh, again, the ball was in the neighborhood, but not uh, not precise. They got a hand on it, but that was about all. So Michael Neal will come out to boot the football from his own 33-yard line. And the dangerous Steve Smith will await the ball as it will come down at the 18. And that's where Utah State will start operating. Well, anytime Steve Smith gets the football, look out. We'll take a break here in the Dome. Utah State up on top, 35 to 10. Jerry, uh, the 
The Vandals are piling up the numbers, but not the stat you want. 227 yards in punting. Been a big punting night. The punting team has been the best part of their offense so far tonight. They've had some excellent punt coverage, done a wonderful job, but we need some scores. We need some receptions. Matt Sock will keep it on the ground. Good deep. Leading that charge was Ryan LaPointe. So LaPointe, who plays defensive end, in place of John Harper, who's been in and out, and also in there was Matt Jasic making a nice play as well. As we told you, the Idaho Vandals will get ready for Eastern Washington as they head on the road for that football game next week. And then they wrap it up with New Mexico State the finale against Boise State the end of November. Broncos getting ready to take out this Utah State team next Saturday. Sock will run. Now there's some hitting down there. Put a little helmet on his helmet there. Coming up on that particular play was a guy from your neck of the woods, Tony Uranga, who was asking about the Homedale crew. He said, how did my brother play last night? His, his guys were up in McCall, the Homedale bunch. Well, his brother's playing great football down there. Tony came up and made a nice tackle there, made a nice hit. You could hear that clear up in the booth. Tony was a pretty good uh, quarterback himself for the Trojans. Yeah, there must be thousands of Urangas down there at <laughs> Homedale. They've been playing forever and ever. Third and long for Utah State. Sock under pressure. Is that a fumble? No, it's an nope. incomplete pass. It looked like for a moment when James Durow came up and made the big hit that that was a loose football. But regardless, the Vandals will get it back. The Vandals have held. And uh, watch the quarterback's arm. Sock's arm just starts to go forward. Right? there and it was awfully close and it was awfully close could have been called either way but it was an incomplete pass the boot on the way Antonio Wilson will take it at the 31 yard line and Wilson gets a nice run back but there is a late flag and Jerry I know why you're why you're letting out that moan because it was a very late flag that was a, uh, let me think about this a minute. Well, I don't know. <laughs> now, well, remember, we're on I... national TV. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I get, I'm a java, java, java. So it looks like this one will be coming back after the nice run back by Antonio Wilson. And I believe the man who was the guilty party in that one was Arnold Gunn. I think probably it did clip too, David. Just that it took a long time for the flag to come out of the pocket and the play was the over and people were the getting up again and finally the, the flag came the out. Team. Ten yard penalty from the spot of the foul. First down. So instead of having the football at the 50 yard line, we got it at the 23. Let's uh, see if we can see the late no. hanky. That's what no. we're waiting for is the late hanky. 12 minutes remaining here in the third frame, 35 to 10. Brian Brennan's got to get something going. Willie Alderson normally catches those passes. Will, Willie's a guy who in high school started out his senior year as a receiver, and then he moved to that running back slot. It was a good move by Coach DeWidzik because uh, he ended up rushing for 2,000 yards that senior year. But th that typifies what's happening for That's the Vandals. Just the, the capsule there of the whole evening. The ball was, again, right in the hands. And take your eye off of it. You look away for an instant. You start thinking about running before you put the ball away. And it slips away. On second and ten, they give it off to Thomas. Thomas gets a first down and more. Well, that was the case. He just kept those feet going, even though it looked like his body had <laughs> fallen into the turf. Looked like he was about to spin out, didn't it? So a pickup of 12 yards will be a first down. You can see he's a little injured there. Watch him. Those legs keep going, but the body stops. Through the hole. Bing, bing, bing. Watch those legs keep going right, right there. Nice run. Nice run by Jerome Thomas. Last year was the backup to Joel Thomas. A lot of people ask me, are they related? No relation. But it was quite a one-two punch with the Thomas guy. Brennan is back. So Blake Eagle coming up. He is a redshirt freshman to make the play and sack Brennan. And those are not plays that uh, a guy needs to have in that situation. 
when Idaho's trying to make something happen. Coming from the right side of your screen, just uh, quick, too quick for our offensive tackle. Gets around him and makes a sack. Crosby Tajian over there on that uh, left tackle spot. And Crosby's one of the veterans on the line. We told you three of the five guys are freshmen. Crosby's one of two seniors. Other than that, it's all freshmen and sophomores throughout the backup. Alderson goes to the top of your screen. Here is Brennan, wants to go deep to Alderson. And Willie says, I was shoved out of bounds. But it doesn't matter. It's an incomplete pass. Well, I guess that's a good play by the linebacker who was in cover just to keep Willie going out of bounds because once he's out, he can't come back in. Yeah, you sideline as your friend if you're a defensive player. It's like a, a 12th man. Two of 11 on third down conversions, and that has been the story of this game. Brido cannot convert turnovers or third down. Brandon fires it up. Just overthrew his receiver, Antonio Wilson, and it looked like Antonio had a step on the defender. I think he was open, slightly open, and the uh, ball was overthrown just, uh, a little bit too high and didn't have a shot at it. Mike O'Neill comes out to boot it. We told you he's coming up on 300 yards worth of punting. The longest of the season was a 56-yarder. He's had a pretty good average tonight, right around that neighborhood. A fabulous boot, and Smith will down it at the 32, and that's where Utah State will come out with the football and the lead, 35 to 10. Jeff Caves is on the sidelines where we've learned the Vandal defense is pushing around the Vandal offense. Well, sometimes emotions run high, and Nick Alexikos must be the emotional leader of the defense. He challenged the offense and said he'd take care of the offense if they didn't take care of business on the field. They didn't get it done. We'll see what the frustration factor is as the game wears on. Matt Sock with the football just past the 30, keeps it on the ground, blue. And Melvin pushes it up for about eight yards. Jerry Kramer, you played with great football players, Bart Starr, Paul Horning, all the wonderful athletes, Vince Lombardi, your coach. Did they ever do that with you, or did the defensive players ever do that, or did you do that to them? Well, uh, Coach Lombardi raised his voice on occasion. He was a little uh, emotional, but generally, uh, the defensive people knew that we were doing everything we could to score, and we knew that they were doing everything we they could. So it's best uh, to let your actions speak rather than your mouth and uh, just take care of your business out there and do your job. A first down for Utah State. You, you had a linebacker that looked like he uh, at Green Bay. I, if he told me to do something, I'd do it. <laughs> Nitschke used to talk a little bit. He'd say, he'd come and say, watch the draw, watch the pass, watch the screen, watch the sweep. And they'd run something. He'd say, I told you, man, I told you. And he'd give you about six options. But he was vocal. Ray Nitsky. Utah State keeping the drive alive. And they've done throughout the evening. Sock again fires. There is Smith. And Smith, as he's done all evening long, firing away down towards the end zone. Gets it up to the 20. 35 yards for Steve Smith, who has been a target to be reckoned with tonight. What's his total yardage for the night? He must be in the 200 plus. Again, we've talked about this great speed of the wide receiver Smith and Sox that throws him about a five yard uh, square out and um, he makes some great moves uh, cause the defensive uh, back to miss up there early and finally we wrestle him down. So that moves the football all the way up to the 19. 183 yards for right. Steve Smith in receiving. Sox been going to that man all evening. This time he throws it up for Adrian Pearson, and it is an incomplete pass. I'm sure that's a career best for Smith, and uh, it looks like it's going to be a career night for Sox. He's uh, well over the 300-yard mark. The Aggies uh, are close to the 500. Losing their Mars and Lee. I thought you were tech. Trouble, you know. minutes 12 seconds go and blue is gone for the touchdown so a 19-yard touchdown 
Melvin Blue just kind of trots his way in. And it's another score for Utah State. Now the Aggies are really piling it on. Virtually untouched. Uh, didn't break a tackle. Didn't have to make too many moves. Got some great blocking up front and just danced into the end zone. Virtually untouched. Well, about all the Aggies can work on is their extra point attempts. They missed two of tonight, but this one is good. And with nine minutes remaining in the third quarter, Utah State putting on a show, leading 42 to 10. Somewhat of a surprise on the score, Utah State leading by so many coming into this game, just a two and a half point favorite of now by 32 points. And that last drive going five plays, 68 yards at Melvin Blue with a little run to pop it into the end zone. Jeffrey Townsley taking it in the end zone and getting it up to the 21 yard line. We're now Idaho. Uh, and it's not necessarily now is Ryan Skinner having a chat and there is a did the official throw a flag it looked like he did he did and that is going to go against the Idaho Vandals 15 yards and Chris Dormy's right there to say uh, the score says enough we don't need 15 more yards a little frustration there uh, getting beat pretty badly and doesn't seem to be able to do anything about it so we get frustrated and take it out on the, the kickoff and take it out on anybody we can But it was the wrong thing to do and certainly General, the wrong time. Personal foul on the return team. Half the distance from the spot of the foul. First down. Jerry, you think back to the last two possessions that the Idaho Vandals have had. Uh, Antonio Wilson ran it back to the 50-yard line. Penalty on that. And then this particular play was uh, pushed up across the 20-yard line. And now it's back at the 10. Idaho definitely shooting itself in the foot, although Utah State is a very good football team. The preseason number two pick in the Big West behind Nevada. That one was nearly picked off. Brian Brennan's got to be careful as Levingston was in there to bat it away. Good closure by Levingston. He uh, reacted very well to the ball and, and moved to the ball and almost picked that one off. Utah State has uh, substituted uh, I believe a whole new defensive line. They have four or five new ball players in there on the defensive line. Well, up by 30. John L. has that luxury. Brandon fires it again and almost the same identical play, uh, lobbing it up for Levingston. Brennan's ankle is taped. Uh, we noticed in the first half that he was uh, limping a little bit on the. Uh, bad ankle and he's taped it up quite severely for the second half and he still still seems to be limping on it a little bit maybe it's pushing off well and not quite as uh, strong on that right leg as he'd like to be Jerry speaking of tape wait till you see the tape job on the single setback Jerome Thomas he got his entire <laughs> thigh all wrapped up there is Thomas in motion there's Brennan from the gun and his oh, sack. Oh, and that had to hurt. Oh. John Latu with the big sack and Brian Brennan just buckled. Looks like big line Crosby Tasian kind of picks him up there like a coat on the floor. And Brennan says, wait a minute, I'm not feeling too well. He went down hard. I was uh, glad to see him get up and walk off the field. And looked like it could have twisted a knee or an ankle or both. Barry Steele checking out Brennan, who probably hurts more inside in that heart area than he does in the knee right now. This has been a tough game for him. That may be the last we see of Brian Brennan in this contest, as O'Neill will boot it from the back of the end zone. is still back there. He is the ace return man for Utah State. The number one returner in the Big West Conference. One man to beat, and that is the punter. Mike O'Neill saved the touchdown, and now Utah State is back in scoring position. And Jerry, what we discussed was would John L. Smith call off the dogs? Let's see what happened to Brian Brennan while we ponder the dogs who kind of bit into get, Brennan's knee. Good pressure right up front, and ah, 
left uh, leg appears to be twisted under him. And now it has a, a sprain to go with the right ankle. So both of them are a little sore by this time. The eighth punt in this ball game for the Idaho Vandals. Sock at the 26 yard line. Trying to score again. What I think is interesting is Melvin Blue carries the ball. If you give Melvin Blue a breather, who would you put in for him? A guy named Demario Brown? <laughs> I don't know, but oh. Steve Smith has sure looked like all world tonight. Uh, we heard so much about Jenkins coming into the ball game, and he is an excellent receiver, but uh, Smith has had a, an outstanding night, a career night. Uh, he's got to be over the 200-yard mark now. Of course, Melvin Blue matching those numbers as well, coming up on 150 yards rushing. The backup tailback, of course, as Jeff Caves told you, an injury to Demario Brown. Gave him a little more time tonight. In fact, a lot more time. He's just carrying people with him, and that was Tony Ranga coming up with the stop. Well, that is one thing that we hear about running backs, that towards the end of the game, when they really start running, they want the football and they just bowl over people. Look at that big offensive line uh, led by Mark Rummel, who's 6'5", 312 pounds. All Big West. Brandon Dyson, the center. All Big West. Mauricio Jordan, All Big West. Just give that guy the ball and let him spin and turn. And is he going to go on again? No. A tackle, a saving tackle at the three-yard line. And tonight, Melvin Blue is All Big West. As is Steve Smith. Kevin Hill making the tackle to save the touchdown. Well, at least at this point, we don't see any of the dogs being called off. 6.58 to go in the third quarter. Utah State leading it 42 to 10. Touchdown. in for the touchdown another score for Utah State and blue is uh, getting tired They're going in for the score of 48 to 10 and now some of the Kippy Dome fans begin to file out they lined up two uh, tight ends in the backfield there Guillermo Chavez and uh, the other tight end and both of them were like uh, blocking backs at number 90 there it's about 265 as a tight end Looks like uh, blocking guards in the backfield. Extra point is good, making it 48 to 10. And the numbers on Melvin Blue, 27 carries, 180 yards, and that was his third touchdown. As Jerry said, an all Big West night. Well, as we told you, next Saturday we'll be in uh, Logan, Utah, to see the same Utah State bunch taking on the Aggies, or I should say the Aggies taking on the Broncos. Boise State trying to bounce back from their loss on the blue today. Here's what it looks like for the Aggies as they try to uh, get back on Nevada. Last year, the pack coming into Logan and spoiling the fun for John L. Smith. The Broncos next week, that's a game you'll see live here on Channel 6. A break before Nevada and then North Texas. Jeff Caves is on the sidelines. Jeff, I saw you coming from the Idaho sidelines. What did you find out? Well, Brian Brennan's foot was hurt in the first half. They taped it. He hurt it again when he got sacked. He's going to be uh, out of the game now, and Ed Dean is going to come in for the Vandals. The, the message from the offensive coordinator, Yarno, to the team is that they have no compassion for you. They will continue to score until the game is done. So he's challenging them to not make it look as bad. Dave? George Yarno trying to fire up the troops. And uh, as we speculated, that would be the last time we would see Brian Brennan at this ball game. And Ed Dean, who is the quarterback of the future, will start things off for the Idaho Vandals at the 20. Well, we knew there was a lot of emotion on both uh, sides of the Kibbe Dome before this football game started. And we know that, knew there was a tremendous amount of emotion among the coaching staff. I talked to John L. briefly, and I said, are you a little tight? And he just grinned at me and uh, with a big smile and shook his head. So he was pumped up for the game, and he'll probably uh, want to finish it that way. So we see the new quarterback in there, Ed Dean from Red Rock High School. 
CCM Rimrock. That couldn't have felt too good for Anthony Tenner. You see the numbers on Ed Dean, who has played sparingly. Uh, a young man who was on a two-year church mission, came back to school. The coaches really like him, say he's the man of the future. And uh, Vandal fans will have an opportunity to see what uh, Ed Dean can do in the number 12 for the University of Idaho. Brian Brennan leaves this game 12 of 36, 160 yards, and the big number two interception. Dean with his first pass. So Antonio Wilson gives Ed Dean a little confidence as Dean goes one of one. Of course, the second string quarterback doesn't get the opportunity to work with the Antonio Wilsons and the Dion Prices of the world during practice. So this is nice to toss to the experts. <clears throat> well thrown ball, perfectly thrown right in front of him, right on the hands. Well, Antonio Wilson's had a, a pretty good outing, eight receptions for 112 yards. Moving up on the all-time reception leading list here at Idaho. Dean on a little delay, gives it to Tanner. Tanner with a nice run. I think Utah State's gonna give Idaho, though, those five, six-yard runs. Yeah, I don't think at 49 to 10, they're worried about five yards of the clip. Although they have put a couple of the starters back in that defensive line. Oops, here they come now. Lindsey Hassel comes back in the ball game. Dean faced with a second down and five. Oh, Fired again. Trying to make a but Ewing's got a man, but there is a flag on the play. Price in a foot race gets into the end zone, but there are two flags on the field, and I have a feeling it's coming back. But what a nice read by Ed Dean. It's almost like a blown assignment by the cornerback on that side and you know it's got to be a penalty against the Vandals uh, on a night like this. Chris Tormey's halfway out onto the field. He's not real happy about the penalty but at 49 to 10 uh, who could blame him? Watch Ed Dean Illegal just pick procedure. this one up right away. Boy I didn't see it. Six men on the line. Repeat, second down. That's again an immature team mistake. Six men on the line, known for quite a number of years that we have to have seven people on the line, and one of the guys just didn't line up on the ball. Chris Tormey can't be happy with the six penalties for 54 yards. That one takes a touchdown off the board. This is where he is different from Brian Brennan. He can tuck that football and run. That is his specialty. And you can see Ed Dean's got a little fire in his motor. The red shirt freshman. You see he's carrying about nine yards of pop. He's not ready for this ball game to be over. Some question last spring of who would uh, take over the starting role. It was a battle between Dean and Brennan, but then Brennan stepped up and took over the job. Brennan is, uh, I believe, on the golf cart. They are wheeling him out as Tanner carries it and is hit at the line. Diamato again had a had a big night. Played exceptional defense all night. I'm looking towards the Kibbe Dome exit and the golf cart, the injury cart. It's no uh, golf cart tonight is hauling Brian Brennan out of the building. So they want to check on that, I'm sure, make sure that Brennan will be ready to go next week against Eastern Washington. And watching the quarterback of the future, Ed Dean, go to work on Utah State. And the reason they blew the whistle was Dion Price had one knee on the artificial surface and he is down right where he caught the football. Of course, we may want to, I know some of the crowd here and the fans watching at home are thinking, hey, where was Ed at the beginning of the game? But it's a different scenario when you're trailing 49 to 10 with three minutes to go in the third quarter. He's seeing different things than Brian Brennan saw in the early going. Absolutely.
Ed Dean with three receivers all to the bottom of your screen. Thomas gets out of the pattern. They go up for Antonio Wilson, and Wilson almost made the grab. Even with the pass interference of Bashar Levingston, almost made the grab. Let's watch that again. That could be uh, offensive pass interference. Well. And you can hear the backdrop of this one going against Utah State. It, it was defensive interference. Pass interference on the defense. 15-yard penalty from the previous spot and an automatic first down. Well, I think those Aggies are letting up just a bit, David. They're up 49 to 10. John L. probably isn't letting up, but I think the boys on the field are, are relaxing a little bit. Back to pass, fires it up. He has a man, two men, Ryan Prestamonico, and Dion Price goes all the way over that roller wheel, which they used to roll the turf, and here he comes out of there almost like a magic trick. Well, at least we hope he's okay. That is very dangerous back there. That particular spindle is how they roll up the turf here in the Kibbe Dome, and I think he's just caught in the netting, playing the role of Spider-Man. <laughs> he's all right. Take a look at it in the end zone. Ed Dean throwing to Dion, and there's a Prestamonico's right there together with him, and Dion a, goes. A mix up there in the pattern. You a little mix up. Two receivers in the same place. Holding on the offense, 10 yard penalty yeah. from the spot of the foul. Repeat, first down. Jerry, how difficult will it be for the Idaho Vandals now? They are not a lock out of the Big West title, but certainly if you lose two games, it is a long shot at best. And you're still in the meat and potatoes of the season. You can't just uh, call it in. Well, you know, uh, you got a young football team, and you got a bunch of uh, kids who are going to continue to play and who want to make the team. And so, you know, chances are that the humanitarian bowl is gone for this year but the more experience we get this year the better we play next year so while we can't totally look ahead to next year we start playing people who will gain experience and maybe play for us next year that was ryan prestamonico uh, we talked about not calling his number very much the first time he's had possession of the football tonight that tells part of the story he's one of the top receivers the third leading receiver on this team Ironically enough, he moved into the starting role when Robert Scott quit and transferred to Utah State. Dean with the ball, fires it, complete. What a nice play by Antonio Wilson to stay inbounds, make that catch, and then go out. I think this is one of the real, uh, real uh, talented uh, acts of a professional or a football player. Watch it. Watch the footwork here by Wilson on the sideline. Drag step, beautiful. Well, he needs one foot in, but he got them both in. Maybe to show the scouts he could get them both in to play on <laughs> Sunday. Wilson, nine catches, 128 yards. He has certainly come to play. Anthony Tenner is the lone back. Dean fires it up and has a touchdown. Antonio Wilson from Ed Dean. A 12-yard touchdown. And Dean is, you'd think the game just started the way he's running around out there. Got a lot of time to throw the ball. Ed lofts it up in the air, kind of nice and soft. And uh, Wilson runs under it, takes it in the corner of the end zone for a Vandal score. Donald Deco in coverage. Couldn't help out on that one. And Troy Scott goes for the extra point. To make some noise in the dome. 49 to 17 with a minute 48 remaining in the third quarter. Here in the dome. That drive going 10 plays, 80 yards, five minutes. And uh, Jerry, I was pretty impressed with Ed Dean. Ed Dean looked very, very good. He 
uh, handled himself well, uh, didn't show any nervousness, uh, stayed in the pocket. That last uh, touchdown pass in the end zone was a touch, a uh, soft pass. He had to loft it, had to put a lot of height on it, and it was very, very well thrown. Uh, much easier to throw a bullet than it is to throw that soft rainbow pass that Ed threw to Antonio on that last touchdown. Bell ringing here in the dome. Jerry, you tell a story of uh, playing football. It seemed like it rained one cold day. The field <laughs> turned into an ice rink. And what I liked, wasn't there a pot belly stove out on the sidelines? There, there were two garbage barrels. Uh -huh. Oh, was, okay. There was a school bus. Uh, instead of a bench, they pulled a school bus out on the sidelines, and uh, all the substitutes sat in the school bus. You couldn't get them out there, there with a broom <laughs> and a shovel. Uh, it, I know Washington State had a game that same day, uh, eight, nine miles away, and they had one paid attendance that day. So there weren't very many people in the stand. Here is the Ed Dean engineered scoring drive. A little 12-yard toss, finishing it off. Fair catch. Wow, and it's a wide football. We were a little surprised uh, to see the fair catch signal. Um, but that's not a bad move by Nick. I think that was Nikia Jenkins. That's Everybody a, stays away from the free ball after 10 <laughs> yards. You can't fair catch a kickoff, <laughs> can you? Is this something new? <laughs> I, I'm not, Nikia normally isn't back there, but uh, so be it. <laughs> Talking about school buses on the sidelines, is uh, locker rooms, and garbage cans for heaters. Those were the good old days. Uh huh. Yeah. 49 to 17. This is not a day the Vandals want to remember. Sox still is in the game. Melvin is still in the game. And the defense hanging tough. I'll tell you what. After that last touchdown, Nick Holt, who's the defensive coordinator for the Vandals, he ran right up to Tim Wilson and said, uh, "I need you to play," and not in those terms. He yeah. yelled it. He yelled at it. He said, excuse me, uh, may I uh, speak to you for a moment? <laughs> but uh, Skinner made a nice uh, stop on that, on that last play. A nice tackle filled in very well. Sock fires it. And a nice defensive play. So the Vandal defense uh, has been in and out, but Kevin Hill coming over and deflecting that ball away from Steve Smith. Well, Matt Sock has to be a candidate for Big West offensive player of the football game, but I think Melvin Blue, Blue is going to be the guy that uh, How about comes Smith? away with the honor. It's going to be tough to pick one, but if I had to guess, John L. Smith would probably nominate Melvin Blue. Excuse me, Steve Smith. Tough pick. Now trying to help out the remaining fans here on third and long. That's been a big play down going up was Nakia Jenkins. And it's interesting how third and long has been very friendly to Utah State where the Vandals just could not convert on third down. So what was there, two of 11 at one point? Uh, again, you know, you've got to have a 50% conversion or 60, 70 percent if you want to win the ball game, and 211, you know, just doesn't get the job done. But they've held the uh, Utah State here, and we'll have a chance to get the ball back with uh, a little over a quarter to play. Antonio Wilson and Bobby Gray are back. Bobby Gray, a poor high school fame. And Antonio Wilson takes it. And Wilson again gets a nice little avenue to run the football along the sidelines. He gets it up to the 38. He's a wonderful runner with that football after he catches the ball. All season long, he's been doing some magic tricks with that football. He's very elusive. Watch him here. Number three takes the ball, starts upfield, breaks a tackle here, breaks a tackle here, breaks a tackle here, breaks another tackle there. <laughs> and slides forward some additional yardage. Well, now that's that's not a kid who's given up on the night and who's quit on the football field. Well, and that can only help his stock in the NFL when the scouts look not only at his ability as a receiver but a punt return man. Jerome 
got locked up in the turf and in the arms of the big defensive tackle. All right. Looked like an awkward position he was in when he went down. John Latu with the sack. He must have a hundred dollars worth of tape on his leg, huh? Well, he got, I think, just up to the original line of scrimmage. Well, the other thing, Dave, we've talked about the third and long, and it has been long. We haven't seen third and one or third and two or third and short very often. Well, it's been, it's getting to be a long night for the Vandals. We have one more quarter to go. 49 to 17 Utah State as we head into that final few minutes of football here in Moscow. Back in the dome set for the final 15 minutes of action. Ed Dean faced with a second down at 10, 49 to 17. Dave Tester, Jerry Kramer, and Jeff Caves. We were hoping for a closer football game, but unfortunately we cannot adjust how those come out. Dean fires it up, trying to get it to Antonio Wilson, who was tangled up. Ed Dean has done a magnificent job in the relief of Brian Brandon, who was carted off in a golf cart. Jeff Caves, what's the story with the starter? Well, the foot was injured in the first half, as I told you earlier. It was re-injured on the sack. Now they're worried about a broken bone in his foot because of the way he was twisted. There's going to be x-rays performed immediately, and then they'll come to a determination of the status of Brennan. That would be, if it is, the 12th season-ending uh, injury to a Vandal. They've had 10 surgeries this season already. They're an OT there. The Vandal injury bug has been tough on Idaho. Dean is 4 of 6 for 53 yards, and that's one he's not going to be able to get away. Not only from the defender, but getting the pass off as well. So the Vandal punt team will head out onto the football field. Third quarter numbers, as you would suspect, going the way of the Aggies, 369 yards. Not just in the third quarter, but accumulated. That would be quite a quarter, wouldn't it? 369 yards. 560 yards total. They have been very tough. This one is going to float into the end zone, and Utah State will take over on the 20. It'll be interesting to see if John L. Smith is ready to make the switch with his quarterback. That would be Brian Benza. Don't forget, we will see this team again, not the Vandals, but Utah State next Saturday as the Broncos try to hang out a first place in the Big West, taking on the Aggies. Talked with Coach Houston Nutt, who said he would be watching this game closely tonight. You can bet the entire Bronco staff is watching uh, both these clubs. Of course, you will see the uh, Broncos in action against the Aggies next week, and then the end of November, the big finale here in the Dome. We call it the uh, Idaho Super Bowl. Broncos and the Vandals. Boise State. What a wonderful rivalry that is developed over the years. Matt Sock is still in there. Melvin Blue is still in there. As the clock continues to roll, keeping it on the ground, Jeff Caves is uh, on the sidelines. As we watch this play again by Melvin Blue, I'll ask this question to Jeff. What, Bingo. what is the attitude, Jeff, uh, of Ed Dean. Was the team pretty fired up about the things he was doing? Actually, Dave, there really wasn't much reaction at all to what Ed had to say or what Ed had to do. At that point in the game, they were just looking at a change. I think they were concerned about Brian Brennan at that point, and Ed Dean was like the substitute that had to go into the game and do what he could. I was just curious because the way he was running around on the football team was not sure. Of course, you can look up at the scoreboard and see the, the scenario there, but whether some of the other players were feeding off the heir apparent to that position. Not really. I mean, at this point, I don't think they were that excited about a change of quarterback trying to change the momentum. It was an injury, and I think they're just overly concerned with getting back into this game respectively. Sock on third and five. Play action. Gets it off, and Guillermo Chavez has it. He's got more than enough for the first down. For 
watch Sox one more time. Watch to throw the ball. And uh, Guillermo Chavez here, big tight end, catches the ball, heads downfield, picks up about 20 yards. Matt Sock him. is over on the sidelines. Lot, of course, uh, as we mentioned, a lot of the Utah State coaching staff spent uh, many a years here at the University of Idaho. Talk to some of them, too, Jerry, because my question was... Illegal participation on the defense, 12 men on the field. The penalty has declined. First, first down. You know, excuse me, Dave, we have a question. Well, even with 12 guys, it's not <laughs> helping out. But, uh, you know, I asked him how strange it felt for them, and they all played it off. But I think it's, it was very difficult for them to come back in different colors. And for some of the guys that played here and now are coaching we against that. their old team. Absolutely. Sock on the ground. Beer truck. 22 it? yards on the pickup as he gets ready to go over 200 yards. Wayne Walker was a great pal of mine here at the University of Idaho. We were classmates together for four years and uh, we were great pals, still are today. And uh, we played against each other and, uh, when he was with Detroit as we watch uh, Melvin Blue come right up the middle, big gaping hole, virtually untouched. We get somebody grabbing at him there about 15 yards downfield, picked up about 20 yards. But when Wayne and I, to finish that thought, played against each other, there was a lot of intensity. And it wasn't really animosity. It was just that we were such good pals, we really wanted the other guy to respect us when we got on the field. Well, a new running back in as Blue gets the breather, and that's Tamar Johnson. Of course, I know some fans were saying, I hope they don't put Tamar, or, uh, Demario Brown back into the lineup. I think it's a clay case of two brothers. Dennis Erickson used to talk about it when he took on Weber State when he was the coach here at Idaho. Very close with Mike Price, who's now the Washington State head man. But I'll tell you what, when those two would do battle coaching against each other, look out. It's like two brothers tangling. Exactly. And that's the case tonight as the old Idaho staff comes back going against their old club. On the ground again. There is a flag on the play. But Johnson is a low, 5'10". Goes about 210 pounds, just a freshman, but he lowers that head. It's like a bowling ball, a big bowling ball coming at you for the strike. I think we had a holding penalty up on uh, Ryan Skinner was trying to get away and pursue on that left side, and uh, he was held. Yeah, I think the brother analogy is a very good analogy, Dave. There's a, there's a love, there's a respect, there's a feeling, and John L. is the uh, you know the mentor here to a certain degree, and. Uh, Coach Torme is the young uh, assistant, and uh, there's a lot of respect between each of the men, and uh, I'm sure they want to keep it that way, so uh, there's a great deal of emotion out there. Of course, they coached together here uh, when Dennis Erickson first came to Idaho. John L. was the, the coordinator at the linebackers, Chris Torme with the secondary. And then Chris would later go to the University of Washington. Had great success there. And then when John L. moved to Utah State, entered Chris Torme to the University of Idaho. And look who's back out there running again. Blue boy. And I'll bet you John L. Smith was one of uh, Coach Torme's uh, greatest supporters and uh, gave him a wonderful recommendation uh, as to whether he would be a good head coach or not for the University of Idaho. 11 minutes and 33 seconds remaining in this football game. Chris Tormey with the headset off. Talking to Tim Wilson. Tim Wilson did not have the kind of game that we expected from Tim Wilson tonight. And I think that's why he's not real happy with the, with the hat and the whole works. Pass is complete. And that's Ricky Brumfield making the grab. Just his eighth reception of the season. Tim Wilson talked about uh, the staff on the other side that recruited him. John L. Smith recruited him. 
coming right back in the ball game. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to come out. He was no. a roommate to Robert Scott. He said, "I tried to talk Robert out of transferring to Utah State." Tony Uranga is uh, blitzing from the outside here, and just you see him upended there at the last moment. And what a nice grab that was, about three inches off the turf. Blue again with the carry, who's now well over 200 yards. We saw our last graphic had him at 209 yards, 211. Now, Jerry, I'm going out on a limb. I got him as Big West Offensive Player of the Week. <laughs> well, I think that's probably a pretty good bet. You know, he's had a wonderful night, and he uh, maybe wasn't as prepared to play as the guys who have been starting on a regular basis. He fills in and, and does a just an incredible job of, of running the ball tonight. Tell you what, if you're running back at that group of linemen at Utah State, that's a good crew to run behind. Blue goes out, and Tamar Johnson picks up maybe a yard. And now's when you've got to worry about injury to your first teamers as uh, Brandon Dyson in the center is slow to get up. You think, boy, I'd hate to get one of my starters hurt when I'm ahead 49 to 17 with about nine minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I think it's time to clear the bench and let everybody play a little bit. Uh, it's obvious the game plan is just to keep it running, keep the keep the clock running, keep the ball running. We'll think Not a lot way. of passing. Yeah. <laughs> Bulldog. James Durow comes up and makes the stop. Jordan, the big uh, uh, right tackle, 6'7", 295, was leading that play around the corner. <laughs> Pulled and was... Uh, out in front of the uh, ball carrier. Maurice de Jordan, a man from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. He never played football until he came here. And uh, he's been playing three, four, five years. And now they're talking about him going to the NFL. He is a big man. Uh -oh. Hang on. Spinning, get on, and hang on. As Arnold Gunn probably saved a touchdown. I'll tell you what, these backs keep coming out of the woodwork at Utah State. Started with Abu Wilson, then we saw Demario Brown, Melvin Blue, and now at number 32, Tamar Johnson to that running back list. Watch Johnson. It looks like he might fumble at the end of this play, but he's another big, strong. There comes the ball. And of course, it bounces right <laughs> back up. That's to been him. the way, the way of this game for the University of Idaho. Eight minutes and 20 seconds remaining. There's the big running back. Now Sox going to throw it into the end zone. As Ricky Brumfield uh, catches it at the two. So just when we think they're going to run, 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 they try to toss it into the end zone. Good defensive play here. Close as well. Take them out of bounds. Not much gain on the play. Surprised that Matt Sock is still at the controls at this point? A little bit, yeah. I think I'd take uh, a main man out and let him rest a little bit. Give it to another 300 pound running back. Those are big looking backs. They're not that big. This kid's 205. He's got a great pair of legs on him. He runs like he's 245. Tamar Johnson with his touchdown. Popping it in for six points, and it is another one on the scoreboard for Utah State, making it 55 to 17. Boom. And it looked like Demar was running 55 miles an hour. He was met at the goal line pretty well, but uh, he was already across. Extra point on the way. Good, and that makes it 56 to 17, which brings us to the question. You think they're piling up the points? We'll talk about that when we come <laughs> back. That's a whole new issue. We'll be back to the dome in a flash. So Utah State leading at 56 to 17, and if you're looking for stats, there is only one number you need. 
649 yards of total offense for the Aggies, 279 yards of total offense for the Vandals. That's Jeffrey Townsley taking it in his end zone, and Townsley has nowhere to go as he's crunched, and I do mean crunched, at about the 11-yard line. Check that, the 15-yard line. The Jerry, as we watch this hit, yeah, yeah, there's a flag down. Looks like it might be a face mask or something. Can't tell exactly, but watch this. Boom. Yeah, and it does look like a face mask there. Inadvertent. Grasping of a face mask on the kickoff team. Five-yard penalty from the end of the run. First down. Jerry, what are your thoughts on the score? 56 to 17. We still see Matt Sock in the lineup. We see over 600 yards of total offense. Do you think John L's adding a little bit to it, which he's been known to do? Yeah, I would have to say that at this point, I think he's uh, uh, pouring it on a little bit, you know, and I, I don't like that personally uh, from this side or from that side. I just don't think we have a place for that in college football. I'd love to win as much as the next guy, but he's scrambling, throwing it deep, and that's intercepted. The intended receiver was Deion Price. And Rashawn Garman comes up with the interception. And Jeff, you pointed out that the uh, first string offensive line is still in there as well. Yeah, they were earlier, Dave. And uh, I'm trying to get a good feel for it now. It looks like there's pretty massive substitution on this particular series, though, uh, specifically up front. And it looks like we are going to see a new quarterback. You know, I've never really felt good about that. I was watching the Boise State Vandal game last year that ended up 64 to 19 or something like that, and I felt just as bad about that situation pouring it on as I do this one. And I just really would like to see a little more sportsmanship and a, maybe a little warmer, friendlier atmosphere. So the change comes at the 724 mark. Brian Van Benza, the freshman, and uh, part of being a freshman is getting the play in and figuring out what exactly is going on. We want to find out. Failure where to wear the required equipment on the offense. That is a charge timeout to Utah State. Brian Benza forgot his mouthpiece. That is what. And they force a timeout to Utah State. Don't forget your mouthpiece. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> 11,103 in the Kiwi Dome tonight to see Utah State roll over the University of Idaho in which started out to be a pretty good game at least through the first quarter and then all of a sudden a couple of turnovers and then Matt Sock got online with a guy by the name of Steve Smith, the running back, Melvin Blue, and that was the beginning of the end as it was all Utah State. Brian Benza is now the quarterback and what happened, in case you missed it, Benza came out and a lot of times, as the quarterbacks do, that are the backups with the clipboard, they forget the mouthpiece. If you don't have, as the official said, the required equipment, it's a charge timeout. He will always carry a mouthpiece from here now on, I'm sure. That's the only mistake they've made tonight, I believe. Oh, look at this bootleg. Panza, who is a wonderful athlete, did he play basketball and he was involved in track and field fumble but he played volleyball and you know what you do with volleyball you bounce it around a little bit kind of <laughs> like what happened there so the volleyball player loses it and this was not what brian benza had in mind first he lost his mouthpiece and then he lost the football watch this uh, bootleg beautiful fake but he uh, gets a little exuberant right here onto the end of the run and instead of going down like a quarterback should He's going to give a little head slap and uh, continue to try to gain a few yards, and he loses the ball right in there somewhere, and uh, the Vandals recover. And it looked to me like uh, the old head slap wasn't wasn't quite the way to go. <laughs> That's for uh, not quite as uh, effective as Merlin. Some of your, some of your friends uh, from Utah State. <laughs> yeah. We haven't talked about Merlin Olson tonight. We did today. Reminiscing about some of the the old days of the Aggies, as Anthony Tenner is tripped up by the turf. It looked like 
Merlin Olson, a member of the Utah State Aggies. Great football player and a, and a really special human being. He was, uh, he was one of my favorite people. I admired his uh, athletic ability, his intellect, his quality, his character. He's just a, a superhuman being. You like the little house in the prairie, right? <laughs> I like him on the little house in the prairie a lot more than I like him. And this is going to go in the other way. That's going to be a touchdown. Fred Miller in for the touchdown. One official says hold everything. And they are marking it a touchdown. 42 yards for number eight. Craig Miller in the right place at the right time goes in for the touchdown. And watch this, Jerry. Yeah, Dean, nice pass and struggling for a few extra yards. And it bounces up and uh, it's off to the races. Ed Dean takes it in from 42 yards out. Well, if you would have told me this game was going to be 62 to 17 Utah State or Idaho or anybody for that matter, we would have never thought that. No, nope. no. Nope. Extra point on the way to add to the interception. And it makes it 63 to 17. The worst loss for the Vandals prior to tonight. Isn't it ironic that that was the start of the winning streak? It was against the University of Montana. It was 54 to 34 on that night. The Grizzlies won the Big Sky title. I don't know if on this night Utah State wins the Big West title, but they certainly made a statement. Don't forget this week on Channel 6, Wheel of Fortune. That comes up at 6.30. Cheers at 11 o'clock. Coach at 11.30. And in between all that, we want you to tune in for our 10 o'clock news. And tune in at 5.30 as well to see our entire crew and wonderful programming on Channel 6. Maybe this is going to be a start of another winning streak for Chris Torby. Well, it'll have to get started again. It certainly sets up a, a wonderful match between uh, Utah State and Nevada. Uh, certainly will be an interesting ball game there. Let me finish that thought on Merlin Olson. I liked him on Little House in the Prairie a lot better than I liked him as a member of the Fearsome Foursome. He was a, a great football player, and I, I really enjoyed his acting skills. Yeah, that uh, Ram front line was was tough to beat. Although Deacon. you guys roughed him up a little bit. Yeah, we got to him a couple times, but they were Deacon and Merlin and Rosie and Lamar Lundy. Wonderful group. The University of Idaho will take it over on the 20. Of course, Jerry, you talk about that showdown between Utah State and Nevada. Of course, the Broncos uh, are surprising a lot of folks. They're going to have something to say about it next week as they travel to Logan, and I think Coach Houston Nutt would be the first to say, if we're going to make a run at the title, we've got to beat Utah State. And you'll see that right here on Channel 6. Next week, the crew will be in Logan. You know, and, you and remember a year ago it was snowing there, and I was told it won't snow this next week. And, and the Boise, the Boise State can win that ball game, but they can't make a mistake. They've got to play their best football game of the year. Uh, they're a young team, also kind of similar to the Vandals in many ways, and they just can't afford to make a mistake next week. Well, in that jury, as we watch the uh, Vandal attack led by Ed Dean. In the running game of Mr. Oh. Tanner took a big hit right in front of one of our Riker. How does Boise State go about beating this Utah State team? What do you have to do? You got to play, you got to, what Idaho tried to do tonight on defense, you can't match up with them head to head. You got to guess with them. You got to stunt, you got to blitz, you got to mix up your package, you got to do a lot of unexpected things. Watch here as Tony Tanner, uh, number two, gets the ball and goes to our right. Ouch. Ouch. Pretty good lick right there. <laughs> Jerome Thomas gets it up for the first down. The band is still doing the wave. The band is hanging on for this one. The band is having a wonderful afternoon. You got to get up on top of them a little bit. You know, you got to have a few breaks and you got to uh, maybe a fumble, maybe an interception, a couple turnovers. 
and then uh, you're gambling, you're blitzing, you're gaming, everything has to go right for you. And you have to play that error-free football. Jerome Thomas with just 31 yards in this ball game. Tenor on the keeper. Actually, the running game, though, really didn't get a chance to take shape when Utah State jumps out to that big lead. You're forced to throw the football, more predictable on what the offensive package is going to be. If you missed it earlier, Brian Brennan got hurt in this football game. Ed Dean coming in. He is the heir apparent to the Vandal attack, although there are others waiting in the wings. Ed Dean looks to be the man that uh, is being groomed for that spot. There is some hitting going on. They are still playing football. Uh, some kids out there that haven't had a chance to play all that much, and uh, they are still whaling. Dean, as we told you, the redshirt freshman, committed to the University of Idaho. And I believe uh, made a commitment to a guy who's on the other side of the field. Ryan. Lucifer. <laughs> well, that's what some of the Vandal fans are thinking that L stands for tonight. Ed Dean then went on a two-year church mission, and he is back. Fires it as a man. Jeffrey Townsley, who made a lot of noise in that first quarter, has been quiet ever since, and uh, Ed Dean's kind of slowed down a little bit, too. Scores from around the country and across the street, not too far away. The Broncos almost had a Louisiana Tech today. 31 to 27 as the visitors come away with the win. Nate Sparks on the shelf for that game. Bart Hendricks playing quarterback. This one will be Faircott at the 28. Sixty three seventeen back to Moscow for the final moments after this. Hugs for everyone on the house, at least on the Utah State sidelines where John L. Smith just took the it wasn't really a Gatorade bath. It was an ice shower as his players dumped the ice on him in celebration of his victory. And he's given each and every one of them a hug and a thank you for the effort they put forth tonight. Jerry, I think this is what I believe. This game will always be a rivalry, but I think last year was the toughest. This game with him coming back, and I think now the talk will not be so much of the return of John L. We'll see that on a headline. But uh, I think basically tonight, now it will be Utah State versus Idaho from now on. Yeah, I think John L. got a lot of venom out of his system tonight. Maybe some hard feelings when he left here. And there was a lot of uh, a lot of emotion tonight, as we told you early on. And, and perhaps a shadow and the ghost will disappear now. Utah State keeping it on the ground. Of course, uh, Jeff Caves has been on the sidelines with us doing a, a fine job as always. And Jeff... Uh, You've talked a little bit about uh, what the Vandals are facing. Will they play in this venue next year? Are they going to get 1A status? Where are they with that? From here, where they're going from here, Dave, is uh, back to the NCAA. I spoke to Oval James before the game, the uh, Idaho AD. This waiver that they have to compete as a Division I member with technical 1AA status is getting close to expiration so they're going to take back a proposal Monday or Tuesday and talk to the NCAA about their plan and the plan includes Martin Stadium and that is an option for the Vandals should come into effect uh, probably 1999 at this point is what James told me and uh, the number of games you know I, he didn't get into that he's, he's fairly confident though the NCAA is going to accept this proposal and grant Idaho just one more year waiver and allow them to uh, be a Division I member and compete at Martin Stadium in 99. Of course, Jeff referring to Martin Stadium, that is uh, just down the road, in fact, uh, eight miles down the road 
in Pullman, Washington, where Washington State plays its home games. Jerry, you think that's a good idea? I have mixed emotions about that. Look out, look out. Oh, I was watching Matt Kramer. He got the ball game here a little bit. Number 97. A, Let's get a shot of 97. Made a pretty nice move on that last play, <laughs> and uh, with that high snap, uh, had a shot at the uh, kicker. But, uh, that was the fourth down, and... Uh, there he is right there, Jerry. Defensive. Proud Papa. Yep, absolutely. We uh, talked with Matt. On the offense. My baby Penalty boy. Penalty is declined. First down, Idaho. All right. But mixed emotions as far as playing? Uh, uh, well, I, you know, it, it, we Washington State used to be a great rival, and we had the, the tremendous... Uh, dislike for them I guess during my year well it here. used to be whoever won the game the other team would have to walk the eight mile distance that's right now that's a rivalry that's a rivalry in my freshman year uh, we won and about 8,000 students made the walk so I guess it's all right in the short term but I wouldn't want to share the stadium on a long-term basis pass Dean's going up he has a man and batted away Speaking of uh, Matt Kramer, we had a chance to talk to him about Dad being in the broadcast booth for this game. It'll be kind of interesting to see um, kind of what he says and what it's like. I've never uh, listened to him that way. I've always heard him on the sidelines, uh, you know, yelling his things and telling me what I'm doing wrong and what I'm doing right and when I did a good play or not. So uh, it'll be kind of interesting. To me, he's my father. He, you know, that is basically all he is to me until somebody brings it up, somebody wants an autograph, or, you know, somebody gives me a little bit about it. And uh, other than that, he's my dad, and that's why I took a little and that's our relationship. Well, you have to be pretty proud of that guy. Uh, he's a sweetheart. He's a nice young boy. And I want to tell you that Jordan Kramer said to his mother, that she hoped, or that he hoped, I wouldn't embarrass him tonight. <laughs> that I wouldn't say anything to embarrass either he or Matt or the Dallas Cowboys. I don't know exactly <laughs> where that came from. We're making a little move here. I tell you that, you know, the kids are still fighting, they're still scrapping, they're still throwing the ball, they're still, we got nine seconds left in the ball game, and we're still trying to get down the field and get another score. Well, it will go down in the last column for the Vandals, in particular in that Big West column. They fall to one and two. Utah State will advance to two and zero. Oh, so there is a three-way tie in the Big West Conference standings. The Broncos are tied for first place with Nevada and this Utah State bunch. All three at two and zero. Oh, and next week it will be down to two as Utah State and Boise State meet up. Well, that Dean fires it into the end zone, and there's a flag on that play, as there will be pass interference, and that will be flagged against Utah State. As trying to get into the end zone was Jeffrey Townsley. He was bumped, so the Vandals will have one more chance to add, more than anything, just some cosmetic work to the scoreboard at 63-17. Old-fashioned spanking here tonight. The... Uh, fine Utah State football team put on quite a clinic tonight put on quite a display uh, they're, they're an excellent football team and we tried to guess with them we tried to do some stunts and uh, Pass interference blitz a little bit the got caught the penalty will be enforced from the previous spot will take the ball to the two yard line first down So with four seconds to go, this appears to be the final play of the football game. We will make an effort to talk to John L. Smith at the conclusion of this. Dean, he's got room to run if he wants to tuck it in. And that is where it will end. He had to make the decision a little quicker than that. And that will be the ball game. 63 to 17 is the final as John L. Smith hustles out onto the field to shake the hands of Chris Tormey and that may put the wraps on this series as far as the heat now I have a feeling oh, next year when 
Chris Tormey goes to Logan, Utah, he will remind his players of that 63 to 17 score. I don't think uh, Coach Tormey will forget this one for a long time. John L. staying out on the field, shaking hands and smiling and laughing and patting everybody on the back. And Coach Tormey heads for the locker room. He gave him a quick handshake and said, We'll see you again. Paul Scancy is the receiver coach shaking John L. Smith's hand. For Jerry Kramer. Jeff Caves, this is Dave Tester from the Kibbe Dome in Moscow saying so long and as always, good sporting.